We're going to call the meeting to order. Today is Monday, April 15th. It is 9 a.m. All council members are present. Town manager, town attorney, town clerk. If you please rise for the invocation, followed by the vice mayor leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We are thankful for this day that you have given us for its blessings, its opportunities, its challenges. May we appreciate and use each day that is given to us. We pray for strength and guidance for each day as it comes, for each day's duties, and for each day's difficulties. May we be challenged to give our best always, and may we be assured of your presence with us. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next, we have approval of the final agenda. Is there a motion to approve the final agenda? Mayor, I'd like to pull uh, off the consent agenda B through G for further explanation, please. Oh, further okay. discussion. B for the through the the rest of the entire. Okay. Everything but A. You got it. Anything else? Any other changes, amendments? Something else. <laughs> well, Mr. Mayor, uh, just just for the sake of uh, uniformity, let's pull A as well, so just so we can draw attention to the event. Yeah. So much for consent. <laughs> Maybe we just need to get that off the agenda completely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. With pulling and consent agenda. In its entirety, is there a motion to approve the final agenda? So moved. We've got a motion by Councilor King. Second. Second by Councilor Safford. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Public comment, Madam Clerk? I have nobody. Is there nobody anyone, signed up. Anyone that would like to speak in public comment? Yes, sir. If there's another public comment at the end of the meeting. Right. Okay. Sure, you don't want to say something? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a long pause there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Seeing no other public comment, we'll close public comment. <laughs> Local achievements and recognitions. Councillor Safford? Uh, I, the Community Foundation did a fantastic job Saturday. Uh, we had a wonderful time, and it's great to see the community come back together. Um, thank you so much for all you guys did. It was, it was a great event. Very good. Didn't uh, saw so you were sitting at the poker table. Were you the last man standing? Yeah, I won a lot, but I didn't win any prizes. How did you win all the prizes? <laughs> I didn't win anything. I didn't gamble one penny. My he wife is the lucky one. Huh? He bought him. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. It's a great event. It was. Uh, Councilor Woodson. I just I was sorry I had to miss all the festivities this weekend, but I'm just really really happy that everything is moving forward and things are happening again on the island, and I'm excited for that. Very nice. Vice Mayor Holt. I just want to recognize uh, Chris King this morning. She is so, and, and many people like Chris King, who I see on the beach, who are so faithful every morning to walk along the beach and pick up trash. Anything they see, anything they can stumble across, they pick it up and they dispose of it properly. It really makes the beach special. And I, I, it's not just Chris, although she's very faithful. I see other people do that as well with their public bag or, or their yellow bucket or whatever they happen to have with them. They pick up that trash and just makes a difference. So I just wanted to recognize those folks as well. Chris also serves as the vice chair of the Anchorage Advisory Committee. But that's all I've got this morning. Very nice. Councilor King? I'd like to recognize Chris, too, but she's gone. She flew back to Des Moines today but uh, for a week of work, so she's not picking up anything. But in her heart, she is. <laughs> I, I just want to uh, express, uh, I had a couple of meetings here on Wednesday, and as I was going home, it was so nice to be able to pull in on the way home off of Vicero Boulevard and fill up my uh, vehicle with gasoline. And <laughs> welcome back, 7-Eleven. Yes, Yay. very nice. Exactly. And uh, thank you, Vice Mayor, for all the uh, assist in facilitating uh, helping them get open, and that's it for me. All right. I uh, echo what uh, Councilor Saffer said, that the Community Foundation event was, was very nice. I'm not sure who ended up with my $2,000 worth of funny money to play with, but it <laughs> sounds like maybe it went to you, Scott, if you... <laughs> Probably. <laughs> a donation, I guess. But uh, it was a good event, and a little piece of advice for anyone that decides to leave early and give their tickets to someone else, put your name on it. The basket that my wife won, there was a disagreement between whose tickets they actually were because it involved chocolate and wine. <laughs> so 
It's the important stuff. Yeah. So just make sure if you're leaving early to put your initials on the ticket. So uh, she's going to kill me for saying that, but love you, honey. Uh, <laughs> and the other thing is I'd like to, to give a shout out to Mark Ashton back there. I saw him this weekend a couple times, once walking around the neighborhood. And then the other time, I, I don't know if it was your personal car or what, but I was driving by and I, I saw you opening up the back door and there was a bunch of PVC sitting in there. And you were at Times Square. It looked like you were fixing something on this weekend. So thank you for your for your extra above and beyond uh, work ethic there. It was very much appreciated. If I can add, he was yes, putting sir. in irrigation so the plants down there. Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. I, he, he looked very intent on what yes. he was doing. So we had some good I didn't want to bother him. But we had some good conversations about that last week. So thank you, Mark. <laughs> we do good. appreciate it. Is, it is noticed. Yep. Um, with that, we'll close local achievements and recognitions. Advisory committee items and reports. Mayor, yes. there's an item under local achievements from Friends oh, of the Mount House. Oh, I'm sorry, Friends of the Mount House. It went right by it. Sorry. I don't know how I missed it with that big old check. So. <clears throat> yeah, we can do the Maybe we should be at. Maybe we'll, we'll, just, we'll do, do the photo up and then we'll call. There you go. Marina is accepting on behalf of the Wow. Yeah. All right, so you see this, this lovely... Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a very lovely unrounded number of $20,814. And we came to this sum because in recognition of kind of the financial situation we've all been in post-Ian, uh, the Friends of the Mound House asked Adam what he could use in order to really move forward in, and get the Mound House truly, truly back in business. And we asked him to present what his needs were, and we said, tell us what your base needs are, and then tell us your dream big number. <coughs> and his dream, dream big number came to excuse me, $20,814. So we decided unanimously as a board to give him that amount of money because the whole business of the Friends of the Mound House is to raise money to give to the Mound House. So... Ta -da. Very nice. That's Ellen, fantastic. Ellen, could you introduce yourself and everybody you're with? Oh. And also, could you let people, a lot of people watch this, could you let people know about the Friends of the Mount House and how they can support it? Thank you very much for that, Jim. So my name is Ellen Vaughn, and I'm the president of Friends of the Mount House. I'm Nancy Smith. I'm the treasurer. I'm Rena. Um, I'm part of the Mount House. <laughs> What's your title? My title is... Um, Museum Development Coordinator. Museum Development Coordinator. So that means that uh, Karina makes everything run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's the but, but Ellen, if folks want to donate to the Friends of the Mount House, how do they do that? So, so the Friends of the Mount House is actually a membership organization, and we encourage people who like the Mount House to consider becoming a friend of the Mount House. And to become a friend of the Mount House, the increase from becoming a member of the Mount House, which gives you access to the facilities and lots of benefits, um, it's another $10. And we, we hold events throughout the year. Our primary one that we held in March in spite of some very inclement weather, um, what was the, the primary source for this sum of money that we are now turning around and giving to the Mount House. Um, but we, ho we hold events, we ho host a lecture series, a monthly lecture series that's typically on the first Tuesday of the month, but sometimes if you have a speaker that's quite extraordinary, you'll do it on another Tuesday of the month. So you just have to watch the calendar. And do you have that. a website? We absolutely, we use the Mount House website because the, we are... T we, when, when the Friends of the Mount House became in turn, well, it's a complicated story. So the, the, we are twinned with the Mount House, so we do not have our own identity. We are the Friends of the Mount House intentionally because we are here to support the Mount House. Very good. And Thank you. Jeff Hauge wants to accept this on behalf of the town. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he just thought of that. Why don't you come up here? Come up here. Yeah. I know, but no, come up here. Ellen, guys. Come up here. With the council Step, up in the background. Here. Step up. We'll stand behind you. How about yeah. that? Yeah. Nice. You want to set it up here so everybody can keep an eye on it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Actually, that's a wonderful <laughs> idea. Got to add 14 to that. Joe's one there, though. Yeah. Got to add 14. Oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. Need a little yeah. donate here sign. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Ellen. So well, thank you for allowing us to uh, 
Very nice job. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Next, we have advisory committees, items, reports, and appointments. Are there any? Mr. Johnson? Yeah. Come on up. Uh, Steve Johnson, Chair of the uh, Marine and Environmental Resource Task Force Advisory Board. Uh, at our last meeting, uh, which was this past Wednesday, April the 10th, there were a number of recommendations we had, uh, we had uh, arrived at. Really, it was the, uh, the meeting was a debrief from the Coastal Resilience uh, Forum event that we had run, which had uh, very good attendance, good live attendance. We've had over 200 views, um, uh, replays of the event. And uh, the purpose for the meeting really was to debrief and uh, digest the information we received from our panel of experts and make some recommendations. So the first three here were, uh, were approved unanimously. The first was uh, very simple. It was basically to amend the managed beach zone dune plant selection, uh, which is a part of the F, uh, FDEP permit for those uh, um, property owners that will be signing easements. They'll be planting their managed beach zones that are a requirement of the easement. And right now there's three separate uh, planting selections that are, are fairly limited. And so um, from the information we received from our panelists, there's quite a few more plants that should be planted for diversity. Uh, in addition, uh, there's limited availability of dune plants really in the entire southwest Florida as the, the, the entire you know, southwest Florida is revegetating after the hurricanes. So uh, these additional species should add diversity, but also increase the total number of available plants uh, available to us. So um, that's the first one. Second is a recommendation to direct. Steve, yep. When you add that list, is that a, is that a state requirement, or who who, do, who, who do you formally keeps that list? Uh, it's not a formal list. It's our a recommendation or our suggestion. I think as part of the um, as part of the permit. So I think they were. It's actually historical. Uh, the last renourishment we had 15 or so years ago. That's the. I believe that's the selection of of plants. So, so the town has the ability to add these plants to the list. I think so. I think our town liaison would have to determine whether or not that's an issue with a with a change in the FDEP permit. I, I couldn't imagine it is, but uh, that's you know. I just curious, I could be yeah. wrong, of course. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Very so good. Um, yeah, and no, most of them are sea oats, dune daisies, railroad vine. Or a combination of the three, depending on if you want a high one or a low one, um, et cetera. So, uh, and the second was a recommendation to direct staff to determine if this, uh, the newly released resilient Lee plan, which I think you may be familiar with, will actually address the needs of Fort Myers Beach, and if not, to pursue a vulnerability assessment and the procedural pathway to apply for state funding to improve coastal resilience. So there is a resilient Lee plan that's out there. I think um, Lee County has uh, developed that uh, for the benefit of all the municipalities in Lee County. Uh, our understanding is, is that it's a very general report. Most of it's about compound flooding, so fresh water, you know, rain, as well as if the surf was to come up, uh, let's say, in a storm. And our understanding is it's not very specific for communities. So what, uh, for instance, what, what Naples has done, is, uh, which isn't in Lee County, but Collier County was doing the same, is they just forged ahead and uh, actually uh, performed a, a vulnerability study. And once that's done, you can, you can actually apply for um, funding from the state uh, to pursue that. And uh, upon receiving it, you put together an adaptation plan, which actually uh, Naples is in the process of, and an overall resilience plan. And then the funds then... Um, that are secured can can um, can be available for that. Did I say that right, Councillor King? You were in on the meeting. I believe so. I think what you're looking for though is maybe more of a Lee County is doing a vulnerability assessment, and that should include us and the ability to obtain state funding via that for a more specific to Fort Myers B. <coughs> okay. Upon their completion of the vulnerability study. Okay. So there's funds available there, and it could all go toward uh, coastal resilience here for the island. You know, if I can just mention, because I'm on You're that resilient Lee, mm -hmm. um, the whole idea of Lee counties, it's an overall, overall plan for all mm -hmm. of the county. And then the expectation is, and I know Andy and team are working on this, the actual municipalities then bring it down to what is important to them mm -hmm. and align it if you will to the lee county plan mm -hmm. so we have a lot more control than you think on what mm -hmm. is actually happening in that resilient lee and i think mm -hmm. andy can 
probably speak to this a little bit more. If I may, Mayor. Absolutely. We have um, <clears throat> we've applied and pretty much been been not guaranteed, but we're we're going to be getting a. a this is a different one, but yeah, we're also going to be working toward you know the vulnerability assessment. There's some some other things that we're doing as well that we're getting you know, getting funding for, but we also want to make sure that we we tie everything together and just cover the whole town, everything, especially especially the dunes and the beaches accesses. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Andy. Uh, the third uh, recommendation was uh, is a simple one. It's basically to, to uh, direct staff to work with Sanibel staff on the research for beach access design. Apparently, they've um, collected a bunch of resources to to do some research on what is the uh, the ideal beach access design. Granted, their beach accesses, I think, are, are longer than ours, but I think we can potentially benefit from that conversation. Uh, that shouldn't be too difficult. I think Andy's had quite <laughs> lately. have had quite a lot of discussions with oh, yeah. Tina. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, and, and and we are we're you know we're trying to make sure that we work you know hand in hand on a lot of things uh, that that we're aware of, they're aware of, and we meet in the middle and 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 discuss everything that can can be a huge benefit for both of us. Perfect. Thank you. And the final uh, motion here <clears throat> was uh, something we learned uh, again through this resilience forum is. Um, is uh, EC zone protection is the uh, recommendation is to town, uh, town council to discourage approval of variances for construction in the EC zone ensure the viability and purpose of the buffer established to provide coastal resilience and prevent encroachment on the beach. Uh, we have a, a very narrow beach. Uh, we were built up very close to the beach and um, that space can be used as a buffer for coastal resilience amongst other purposes. I was Steve I wasn't able to watch that meeting. Are you Recommending all, even if there was something there before, allowing them to build back what was there before, but nothing new. What was what was the discussion? Well, the discussion was, and and there were two dissenting votes on the uh, on the uh, motion. But essentially, uh, obviously, there's a there's a special exception in the variance process with really any anything we do with this town. Um, but of course, when that land development code and the comp plan was originally put together. It uh, essentially had very strict language there not to build in the EC zone. And for that, uh, that discussion, we felt had already occurred through whatever our forefathers had decided that if something in the EC zone was destroyed during a hurricane, uh, to not allow it to be built back because it was basically grandfathered. So when the, the land development code and the comp plan was put together, uh, of course, they were... Um, working with the landowners and said, sure, if you're already built out in the EC zone, then you're grandfathered, like we do so much of. But again, in, that, uh, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the comp plan, it certainly says that, you know, upon dis you know, destruction or whatever, you can't rebuild back into it. And uh, I know that's something that the, the town has pursued uh, or allowed. And um, I think from the perspective of Murph. Uh, they would say abide by the you know the land development code and um, and 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 prevent that if you can, because uh, ultimately the same thing will happen again to those structures or whatever might be built in the in the EC zone. Okay. So that was uh, a recommendation, of course. Yeah, I just so. wanted to get some context of what the conversation was about. Yeah, yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. But I think what we've allowed is repair. Yes. Repair and maintenance of due to the storm, not newly developed well that's why i was trying to get the clarification yeah. was were they recommending not even allowing what we've allowed so far for people to build back what they had previous to storm and it sounds like that's what your recommendation is is to nothing gets built back in the easy zone right i think if it's um like you said i, I again i mean i hate to speak for, for all of murph but yeah i think if it's uh, a repair that's a little bit different than a, a new structure or or something along those lines and i believe maybe the the pool um, a decision I think might, you might be referring to. I think that was basically if it could be repaired, it can stay. If it had to be completely rebuilt, it couldn't. I can't recall right. if that's mm -hmm. exactly what it was. But yeah, yep. um, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's where it's at. Okay. Any other questions? Nope. Any other All questions right. for Steve? Thank you, Town Council. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have approval of the minutes. We had the Town Council meeting from April 1st, the management and planning session from April 4th, and the town council special meeting from April fourth. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. A motion by Councilor King. Second. Second by Councilor Woodson. Any further discussion? <clears throat> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. The 
Minutes are approved. Next is a consent agenda. The first item, special event for the July bridge closure. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I, <clears throat> certainly not opposing this. I think it would be helpful. Is, is Jeff the contact person on that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Jeff, would you just come up and just uh, sell this a little bit and encourage people <laughs> to not only attend, but if they want to participate, how does one go about participating? Uh, yeah, so Jeff Hauge, uh Cultural <clears throat> Parks and Rec Director. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're already starting the planning for 4th of July. Um, we're going to have both the parade and the fireworks, uh, which is exciting again. we I think we had a, a lot of success with not only the last parade we did, but uh, the fireworks we had for New Year's. So um, right now we're just in the, the permitting stage. Right now we have to get approval from the council to to close the bridge before we can do the permit, um, especially for the you know the parade uh, and the fireworks. So there'll be two two separate ones. Um, we will have stuff out for the parade very soon. Um, we're going to be working a lot with uh, I think uh, Beach Talk Radio as well to put that on and, and get that promoted. So the, more information to come on on the parade, but uh, we will be having it and uh, it should be a. a Spectacular event, and uh, the same same company that did the the New Year's uh, New Year's fireworks is going to do this one. So, I, and I think if you saw the New Year's ones, you everyone should have been pretty happy about that. I think the Fourth of July, you don't have to stay up as late, correct? No, nine nine p.m. is when they were going to light off the fireworks. That's uh, that's pretty typical. <laughs> yes, we do not have Was to stay up till Oh my God, <laughs> really? Very well, you know, and that's that's with a little bit of an asterisk. I mean, we might have to stay up a little later if it rains or something. Oh, well, it'd be delayed, but uh, the schedule is, is nine p.m. Uh, for the fireworks, which really coordinates uh, with a lot of the other communities around around the area. They do it all at nine, and you, it's kind of neat to see them all along the beach uh, going off all at once and Jeff just I know you don't have the details yet but just general guidance for folks who may want or companies who want to may want to put something uh, some kind of a float or a display or you know whatever they want to do for the parade what, what's the general guidance um, we'll be sending out applications or I'd say in the next probably month month and a half we'll have that all set up with the fees and and that but yeah it's, it's a simple application and it, if you were in the last one it was it was a good time it was a, it was a great time so yeah right. thank you very much i challenge anyone to beat the chris sloth this year <laughs> <laughs> yeah we encourage you know a lot of floats uh, i think it makes for even a better time and uh we'll go back to our our probably our normal route um down crescent so you know i good. think it, to to Councilor Safford's point, uh, the crew of sloth has usually always put a pretty good float in. Uh, I would suggest going back and getting a couple of those pictures, not just of the crew of sloth, for, but and get it out there just to get the juices flowing, if you will, because friendly competition is always fun. Yeah. <laughs> but expect expect to be let down. Yeah. Crew of sloth is coming. If I may, if I if I'm if I may, add, when it's a level playing field, it's fun. Uh, we'll just leave it there. Yeah. Okay. Chili and, oh. and Jeff, if I could. Oh, there's such sour grapes on that one. <laughs> I know. On a much more, on a much more. Deal with it, get over it, or get counseling. On a much more friendly, on a much more friendly and positive note, uh, there's a rumor that uh, the King Elvis Presley will be in the parade from Graceland. Maybe oh. a special appearance. That's oh. what I'm hearing. Oh. Will said King be showing off their vocals? Uh, said King, uh, it, it, it's 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 very speculative at this point. Of course, you know all the various. Weekly uh, 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 magazines you see in the grocery line, you know, they, there's a lot of speculation about the Kings, uh, where he's at, you know, where his presence is, you know, is he alive? Uh, but but he's alive and well, and the rumor is he's interested in coming to Fort Myers Beach. Yeah, well, oh, that, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's that's yeah. great. We, we encourage that. And Thank you very much. Yeah, so yeah. one thing I, I want to comment on is this parade is is essential for our beach. It's just it's a for continuation of of we're getting back. I mean, we have. 30, 40 mm -hmm. friends come in, they rent properties, they, they get hotel rooms. It, it's an economic benefit, and the more, more we promote it, the better off we'll be. And it's and thank you. Yeah, and we're starting early. Um, you know, with, with the New Year's one, we kind of started late uh, with the push. And yep. this one, we're starting early. We'll get everything done early and get the word out and, and make it, make it a, a great thing. And uh, we're trying to, I guess, just to interject a little bit more. As a, a Parks and Rec department, we're trying to do more. Of, we're going to try to schedule more events throughout the town too. So, whether it's you know just smaller pocket pocket events or bigger events, we want to, you know, we notice other cities, Cape Coral, Naples, Bonita, I know the different uh, dynamic there, but we want to really push that on on the the town and get get more activity going in events. So, what is the town float going to be? 
So well, there's the Bay Oaks float. Well, there's well, there's Bay Oaks, but there's it needs to be a town float. That that could be a whole special session on a council meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can do that. That's a challenge. Still not going to beat Chris Law. Okay. That's been reported. Although the, accepted. <laughs> the friends of uh, friends of the arts is helping us with is that. Uh, yeah, Friends of the Arts is helping uh, Bay Oaks out with with their float this year. They're going to donate some time and money and and make oh, it really great. It's going to be more of a project for the kids. Yeah, uh, we're Very in preliminary nice. talks about that. Karen's definitely uh, spearheading that one up a little bit. And, yeah, uh, so I'm I'm on the um, board for Friends of the Arts, and and it's one of those things that we, you know we have it. It's been so dormant for so long and we're trying to get back in the swing of things and the whole idea of friends is the or of the arts is to support any kind of art and culture whether it be music or art or dance or whatever and so we wanted to provide some scholarships for beach kids elementary and get them involved and thought the best way to do it would be through uh, their after school programs um, to help design the float have the older kids take some leadership positions with the younger kids. Um, we've already met with Dr. Kohler, and she's totally on board. And I think we have another meeting coming up mm -hmm. next week, next I think, week, yep. with um, actually, I think, the Bay Oak staff the kid, yeah, and, 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 and the, the kids. kids yeah. yeah, we're trying yeah. to make it a, a kind of a, a fun leadership thing for our older ones, like Karen said, so they can take some ownership, have some say in, in what their programming is and what their float's going to be. Yeah. Very nice. It's going to be fun. It, they'll beat the crew of sloth, I'm telling you right now. Yeah. Well, they're, <laughs> they're kids. The, the idea is they they're thrown kids. around. Eh? Whoa. <laughs> wow. Okay. Oh, Smack kids. talk city. I'm going to scoot to the right a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mo uh, Mayor, I'll move uh, approval of consent agen agenda item A, special event, 4th of July, bridge closure. Now a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Next is item B, STA number 12, Access Engineering. John? Just asking for further discussion about what this is. Yeah, I don't know if Sarah feels like or wants to get up, but I'll try to do <coughs> a, a decent job of this. Uh, obviously, we, we value our relationship and our professional um, partnership with Access. This um, is, is, we know that we're doing more and more and more, as is evidenced by the town rebuilding, and so we're asking more and more of Access and while we are still trying to get some in-house planners and things like that, and we both know that it's difficult to hire people, <coughs> we need to, to, you know, pass this to, to keep them engaged. And there's there's so many things that they're doing with the comp plan and other other things that you ask them to do. So it's just this this is a restricted fund, and this only it comes out of a fund that can only be spent for these type of things. So Sarah, I don't know if you have something. Does not nope. <laughs> <laughs> going for the sympathy vote now. Um, so in, in the past, in past years, we have done a similar thing. Um, we, we put in the amount that will get us through a portion of the year, knowing that we may have to ask for an increase at some point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. could, Mr. Town Manager, could you just explain how you utilize Sarah's firm? In other words, how do you bifurcate... Uh, what you delegate to her firm versus what we do in-house, and, and then how is that billed appropriately to the applicants? I'm actually going to turn that over to the Director of Compliance and Operations who actually works and assigns things. So as far as what we use them for, we use them for everything. Um, Sarah is obviously probably one of the smartest people in the state, if not on the planet, when it comes to planning and zoning. <laughs> um, she's constantly working with our staff and with me trying to get us to somewhat comparability, at least in my case, um, and, and understanding what we need to do to move on. So when we need to do something, big project, little project, that we don't understand, her and Jason have those answers. Um, and that's kind of why we rely heavily on them for that. As far as how we tie that into the projects, all that time is billed um, accordingly to like a big uh, project, uh, depending how, how, we, how we're doing it. But she's constantly on the phone with myself, with Andy, uh, with staff every single day, um, and, and that's invaluable. So just to just to, I know these are it, it, it's much more complicated than this, but but just in general, they're handling the comp plan and the larger commercial projects for the town. Is that a fair 
generalization? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll move STA number 12, Access Engineering. A motion by Councillor King. I'll second. Seconded by Councillor Safford. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Next is item C, resolution 24-74, final renewal of environmental engineering firms under RFQ 20-06-AD. John? I think these a uh, bunch of them kind of run together, but uh, I noticed today when I was watching the local media that uh, we're re nourishing the beaches with berms and stuff on the north end today. So the media was all over that, so I would just like a little further explanation of things. They are not wasting any time either. If you no. saw that pile of sand they had at the red coconut mm -hmm. and how fast it was gone, yep. it was it was gone. <laughs> it was gone. <laughs> they are not wasting time. It's crazy. Hey, morning, uh, Chad Shoots, environmental staff. So uh, this particular STA is for continuing services. We have um, uh, those firms on hand to accomplish uh, various uh, marine and engineering tasks um, as we see fit. Uh, for that item with regards to the North Berm, we are you had questions with regards to that project. No, I didn't have questions, but I just knew it was starting today because the media was on top. Yes, on top of it. Yep, yep, yep. I've yep. seen you quoted a few times. And uh -uh. <laughs> you want to just give a, a couple sentences on the North Berm project? Sure. Yeah, um, we're going to be getting into it with these next um, couple of items, but uh, we're going to we'll be. Let's wait. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Well, I think the most significant thing on this, too, is if we don't extend these, then we have to go back out for RFQs, and that's just going to delay everything. So we've already decided, and we just need to Yep, all good, forward. capable firms. Yep. All right, any further discussion? I'll move Resolution 24-74, Final Renewal of Environmental Engineering Firms under RFQ-20-06-AD. Second. <clears throat> Motion by Councillor King, seconded by... Councilor Woodson, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Next is item D, resolution 24-78, STA number 11, Coastal Engineering Consultants, Inc. John? I just usually, when there's money associated with it, I'll just usually like an explanation of what's, what's this regards to and how it's being paid. Yes, sir. Uh, construction phase services for the uh, North uh, Berm, um, project that's uh, starting today. So uh, that includes uh, pre and post construction surveys uh, to verify volumes, um, as well as the plans and uh, quality control that goes along with that uh, construction phase um, service. Uh, that will be 53,000 tons from Crescent Park to Bowditch Park, um, again, starting today. Funding comes from funding will be both the in, uh, the engineering the uh, sand itself as well as the contracting services to deliver and place the sand onto the beach are all paid for by I believe it was uh, Senate Bill 4A uh, that the governor signed in uh, at the end of uh, 2022 that 1.89 billion uh, million dollars <clears throat> um, will pay for all three of those items to accomplish that project 100 percent. Thank you. Chad, I know the folks from the Best Western are extremely appreciative of your efforts on this, but I, I thought I'd just say that publicly. That's a big deal for the – they feel very exposed right now, and this is a big help yeah. for them. Thank you. Yep, yep. That whole uh, north side is very uh, low and susceptible to overwash. Any other questions for Chad? Mayor, I'll move Resolution 24-78, STA, number 11, Coastal Engineering Consultants, Incorporated. Second. A motion by – Councilor King, seconded by Councilor Woodson. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Item E, Resolution 24-77, Sole Source Steward Mine Materials. John? Again, for um, what we're doing and, how, and who's paying for this. Yeah, so we're, uh, um, you know, this, this, this project was made possible by uh, both um, the competitive bid that uh, EarthTech Enterprises gave us allowed us to stretch that $1.89 million, which would not have been enough to uh, lay out that much berm prior. But once that competitive bid got in, um, that, that made the numbers work, as well as this uh, direct, directly purchasing this sand from uh, Stuart Mine rather than having a, a markup 
um, by a contractor to buy it and then mark it up and give it to us. So um, this and that's is just high quality sand too. Yes, sir. It's uh, it matches our our uh, color requirements as well as the grain size for FDEP. So Where's the mine? It's uh, it's in Immokalee, uh, Collier County, straight out east. Let me tell you, eleven dollars and seventy three cents for a ton of sand is a good deal. That doesn't include the trucking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the cost is covered under. Yes, sir. Again, yeah, the, the the cost of this sand as well as the engineering and the delivery and placement onto the beach are all covered by the uh, FDEP grant of $1.89 and change million dollars. Okay, thank you for the explanation and thank you for all your hard work in putting all this together. Yes, sir, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, all right, any further questions for Chad? These are running away. I'll move <laughs> resolution 24-77, sole source steward mines materials. I'll right. second. Got a motion by Councilor King, seconded by Councilor Safford. Any Is further? it steward or Stewart? Because in the writing it says with a T and in the explanations is with a D. T. With a T. Stewart. Thank you. Motion by Councilor King, seconded by Councilor Safford. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. Next is Resolution 24-73, Concrete Work for Bay Oaks Recreational Campus. John? Just an explanation of what we're doing here and the cost, I guess. Yeah. Uh, Jeff Hauge, Cultural Parks and Rec Director. Um, so we had a, a number of projects here uh, around the Bay Oaks campus. We are using the funds from the, the Capital Park Improvement Loan um, that we have so for some, I mean, if you've been out to the ball field, we did a concrete wall, makes it look really nice. Uh, we did some sidewalk work, some curbing. Um, we had a, a number of projects that were kind of separate projects, but added up to a, a bigger total. Um, so we, this is a resolution because anything over 25000 has to come to you all. Um, so that's why that's in here is these little projects added up with the same company to, to that. So um, that's kind of where we're getting it at. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Is there any plan to use that fund? I probably should ask you this before the meeting, but is there any plan to use that fund before it expires to fix, say, like the concession stand over here or anything like that? Because yeah. I know that the time is running out to be able to use that. Yeah, we have until the end of May um, to have it done and completed. So time is really running out. Uh, but we do have some quotes. We're just trying to figure out. I'm waiting on one more because um, we need the three for the, uh, the FEMA sure. uh, reimbursement. So... Uh, I talked to him last week. He said he was going to have it to me last week, but we'll see. I'll uh, I'll reach out to him today, and then we can get started on it. Most of the people that I talked to, the other two, actually all three said they could do it in a fairly quick manner. Okay. But, yeah, we do have some some for that as well. Yeah, just very low interest loan, so it's <laughs> we're not going to get that interest again. Yeah, that's why we're, we're trying to use it. I mean, we had... Uh, you know, we had ideas, you know, like the dog park idea kind of got nixed a little bit just because of um, being by the waste, uh, the the wetlands, we can't do that anymore, so mm -hmm. possibly going to look for a new location for that, but no plans yet for that. Um, we ordered a couple things, uh, nice amenities for uh, Bay Oaks. Uh, one is a, a curtain that we ordered um, that'll go across so that the gym can be separated, uh, which is great. Uh, so cool. you can have one, you know, one thing going on, on the other, uh, one, the other side. So okay. Any other questions for Jeff? Mayor, I'll move uh, Resolution 24-73, Concrete Work for Bay Oaks Recreation Campus. A second. Okay, got a motion by Councilor King, a second by Councilor Woodson. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries unanimously. Next is Resolution 24-75, the restroom trailer for Newton Beach Park. John? Just an explanation of uh, this and the cost and how it's being paid. Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, We've been talking a lot about Newton Beach Park and putting it back at least, uh, you know, a portion of it for a restroom, some parking, uh, and a beach access going to the beach. Um, so we're we're still going forward with those plans. Um, we need to replace a restroom. We had we have TDC funds, uh, tourist Deve development funds. To um, we had put in the budget to rent one, uh, which was about forty five thousand at the time. Um, now that we went back and got new quotes. Of course, everything is is more expensive. It was more like fifty five or sixty thousand um, to just rent it for the year. So we we asked TDC if it was okay if we if we allocated some of the the staff funding costs that were uh, supposed to be in associated for Newton Beach Park um, to put towards a, buying one along with that re that rental. 
uh, costs that we had already requested, and they, they approved that. Um, so we're actually using the whole thing will be TDC funded uh, to put it back uh, a restroom trailer. Um, a great job on doing that. And do you have an estimated time when this will begin? Yeah, if we can get this uh, passed uh, and get it in fairly quick, they thought by Memorial Day we could get it shipped to us and hopefully get it plumbed in and, and put the electric to it. So your plan is to hard plumb it just like the Palm Avenue one? It'll be exactly the same, same exact trailer. Okay. Thanks, sir. Any other questions for Jeff? Mayor, I'll move resolution 24-75, restroom trailer for Newton Beach Park. Second. A motion by Councilor King, seconded by Vice Mayor Adderholt. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries unanimously. <coughs> Next are the public hearings. Do we need to swear anybody in? No. No? Okay. Let me go to the first one. The first is the first reading and public hearing on ordinance entitled, and an ordinance of the town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 34, Article 3, Division 5, Sections 34-675, building size to 1, change building height from two stories to three stories for properties that front on Times Square and Bayfront pedestrian plazas, the north side of First Street, the south side of Estero Boulevard between Old San Carlos Boulevard, and the main pedestrian crossing, and two, change building heights height from two stories to three stories for properties that front on Lagoon Street, Crescent Street, 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 5th Street, east of the Skybridge only, providing for severability, codification, Scrivener's errors, conflicts of law, and effective date. We'll now open the public hearing. Sarah? Good morning. Sarah Probst with Community Development. The ordinance language that is before you corrects a code issue that has been noted in the code before, but prior to Hurricane Ian, there were no vacant lots in that area, so the code had, was sort of on the back burner. Um, since Ian, these properties are trying to determine what development potential they have, and this code it change is necessary to resolve that issue. The code currently allows buildings to be 30 feet above base flood elevation, but limits the number of stories to a single story above flood elevation. The proposed change would allow the building to be a total of two stories above base flood elevation and 30 feet. This code glitch applies to several parts of the downtown zoning district, Times Square and Bayfront Pedestrian Plaza, north side of First Street, south side of Estero Boulevard between Old San Carlos Boulevard and the main pedestrian crossing, Carolina Avenue, Lagoon Street, Crescent Street, first, second, third, and fifth east of the sky bridge only north side of estero boulevard west of old san carlos boulevard and east of crescent street primo drive palermo circle miramar street north of estero ohio avenue and virginia avenue at the lpa hearing on april 6th the lpa unanimously recommended approval of the request with one member absent staff asks that town council provide any p feedback and schedule a second hearing all right. Questions for Sarah? Councilor King? None at this time. Vice Mayor Idaho? Uh Sarah, I watched the LPA hearing, and this this appears to be, and I don't want to mischaracterize it, but this appears to, in essence, be a technical correction. Is that a fair characterization? I would say so. I, I think that at the time the code was originally written, um, well, the flood code was not the way it is now. Um, the way it is now, it only allows one story, uh, which is is not functionally worthwhile in in that part of the town um so yeah this makes this makes those streets the same as every other part of the island every other part of the island is allowed to have two stories above flood right thank you mm -hmm. council woodson no i just think it to note too that it's you're not increasing the height it's still staying at 30 feet mm -hmm. but you're just increasing how that's laid out yep council Safford. i'm good thank you the only question I have, I know there was some discussion a little bit at the LPA meeting about having stories versus height, and I'm still kind of on the fence. I'm not understanding what, at the end of the day, if 30 feet is the land development code that maximizes the height that you can do above base flood, does it really matter on the stories? And from a staff perspective, does it? do you think it's important to have that there? Does it matter one way or another? And I guess what I'm trying to get at is if someone can fit three stories in the 30 feet, at the end of the day, um, as long as it meets all the other requirements, does does the town really have a, a need to worry about that? 
Um, I guess it would depend on if you want to allow additional stories in that area that aren't allowed in other areas. Um, so right now the code is pretty much, um, I think there's one section that may allow three stories over flood, um, but the rest of the town is only allowed two stories over flood. So it's, and, and I'm not exactly sure construction wise how that would work if it would work, um, but it, it's certainly up to you. I couldn't speak to the advantages and disadvantages of it. I can't see how it would benefit, but if if your wish would be to not have any limit on stories. No, it was just a, a general question globally. I wasn't specifically yeah. talking about that, but island-wide, I mean, if someone wants to have three 10-foot 10, 10 high ceilings versus two that, you know, are, are taller, mm -hmm. does at the end of the day, if it doesn't change the density or the, the, if it increases the chances of a layout, or somebody doing something different is does the staff really have a any skin in the game or really feel any detriment to that and this, maybe this is a future conversation but yeah um I, I don't know that staff um particularly has an opinion on it i'm because i'm not sure how it would work um and that may be a really good question going forward when we're doing the land development code update you know if if it's appropriate to even have that or you know even if the town wants to consider allowing three stories in three stories over flood in some places. Yeah, I've just always struggled with if 30 feet is the requirement or the maximum that you can do, what's inside that, is it, is it really matter? Is, is the outside height is what it is if you have three stories in there versus two. And I can say that it is, it is typical for most communities to have both of those measurements it in is. there, both okay. the number of stories and the height. Um, it's not necessary always, but it, it does ensure that buildings kind of have a similar look, um, okay. which is a lot about what zoning is. Sure. Okay. I just had a general question. I know they mm -hmm. they felt it was important to keep it in there, so I just wanted a little more clarification from my mindset. Yeah. But okay. Um, no other questions yet. Thanks. We will open it up for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the council for further discussion or a motion. Is there any further discussion? <coughs> Is there a motion to approve moving it to a second reading? I'll make a motion to approve ordinance 24-08 downtown building height. I'll second. I got a motion by Councilor Woodson, a second by Councilor Safford. Any further discussion? You want a roll call vote? Okay. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor Safford? Aye. Vice Mayor Adderholt? Aye. Councilor King? Aye. Mayor Allers is aye. Motion carries unanimously. The next is first reading and public hearing on an ordinance entitled An Ordinance of the Town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, Section 34-232, Required Hearings of a Division 5 Public Hearings and Review of Article 2, Zoning Procedures of Chapter 34, Zoning Districts, Design Standards and Nonconformities, to require only one public hearing before the Council Planning Agency, LPA, for variances, extensions, and satisfaction of conditions of previously approved land use approvals if the decision by the LPA is unanimous and the town clerk does not receive a request by anyone for any additional <coughs> hearing before the town council within 10 business days after the LPA decision. A public hearing before the town council is required for variances, extensions, or satisfaction of conditions if the decision by the LPA is not unanimous or if anyone requests such hearing within 10 business days after the LPA, providing for codification, severability, Scrivener's errors, conflicts of law, and an effective date. I'll now open the public hearing. Anyone? Okay. Becky. All right. Yes. All right. Y'all had asked to shorten the process on um, some of the variances and what this would do is it would allow the um, for a variance that was unanimously decided by the LPA and if no one from the public came in and requested any sort of um, a, a double hearing before the town council um, this would allow just one hearing before the town council to approve it. So, so it would just, it would hurry things up if something's not controversial. Right, just for clarification, if they don't have 
seven people there. If it's still six zero, or somebody's not there, or somebody recuses themselves, whatever. It's, as long as it's a zero on the back end. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. I mm -hmm. think we need to, again, get shovels in the ground. And it still comes before town council for one yes. reading. Yes. Yeah. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. Uh, that, that, no. that's, that's not what it was supposed to be, right? No. no. Yeah. Becky, I'm, I'm confused was... by that. We, we, if it, if the, the whole purpose of the exercise was, it, first of all, it affirms our confidence in the LPA. Uh, but if it's unanimous and it's in these categories, which is a subset of, of what we do here, and it's unanimous from the LPA, then it's, then it's immediately affirmed. And it does not come before the council, unless, unless there's unless there's that request. Right. Yeah. It actually you're, says it in the. It actually correct. says. Yeah. In the, right. yeah. Okay. I was I was yeah. answering the question. It definitely would come before the town council if it's not unanimous or if someone has yeah. some kind of an objection to it. Yeah, okay. that's what I wanted clarification on. I'm sorry, I didn't <laughs> answer your question okay. correctly. Obviously. And the someone could be anyone. It doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be anyone. Be, right. Okay. Yeah. So I just would say a couple things if I could. Uh, first of all, thank you, Becky. This is something that I've been trying to do prior to Ian. Uh, and I thank my colleagues for this. I thank the LPA for this. Uh, but the town attorney in particular, I think, because I posited this to our previous town attorney and we just never really got anywhere. But you, you're, you're, you're getting stuff done, Becky, and I appreciate that very much. This okay, is, thank this you. This seems like a little thing, but it's actually a big deal for a number yes. of reasons. Number one, it affirms our faith in the LPA. B, when people have to come before the LPA for something that's not controversial, it takes a, a big part of their day, uh, and then <coughs> they have to come back to the council again for what rarely ever uh, uh, manifests itself as controversial, and it's just a procedural exercise where many of these folks have attorneys, they've got land planners, they're spending all kinds of money to sit here for an exercise uh, that really bears little fruit because it's often just uh, uh, just we, we affirm the LPA's decision. So not only does it take the time of the applicants to come and, and cost for the applicants, but all the people in the uh, people see our agendas are very long. So all the people in the audience who are waiting for their item to come up, they're also delayed. And it just for from a, just the, in terms of respect for our citizenry, I think it respects their time and their resources, particularly post Ian when we're facing all these challenges. And, 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 and let's be honest, it does make the council more efficient as well. So I appreciate your efforts on this, Becky, and I and I would move approval of oh, ordinance. Public comment. I'm sorry, I will not move <laughs> approval. <laughs> Any question? Any questions for uh, Becky before we? All right. Public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak in public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public comment, bring it back to the council. Take it away, Vice Mayor. And before I make the motion, Becky, I would ask that you and Nancy incorporate some kind of a notice, if you will, in the script that Nancy reads before each oh. LPA hearing so that so that Good anybody idea. in the audience or who's listening could actually hear this prerequisite so they may not be directly impacted but they maybe have a friend or a neighbor that they could call and say oh you may want to object to this this is in your neighborhood okay. and here's what you need to do uh, i think it'd be great to have it in the public script so people could have an idea that this is their recourse and that everybody can certainly have deep due process and with that i would move approval of ordinance 24-06 expedited variance extension and condition review i'll second all right we've got a motion by vice mayor adderholt seconded by councillor safford any further discussion Vice Mayor Adderall, I vote. Aye. Councilor Safford? Aye. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor King? Aye. And I'm an aye. Motion carries unanimously to the second reading. Next is ordinance, the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance entitled <coughs> An Ordinance of the Town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, amending and restarting ordinance 23-05 to permit temporary uses in certain zoning districts in response to and as part of the town's recovery efforts following a natural disaster or other emergency situation. One, by a governmental entity for the benefit of the public. Two, for the residential manufactured homes, mobile homes, motor homes, recreational vehicles, or other temporary dwellings for residential purposes. And three, for movable commercial structures for the delivery and sale of goods and services to the public, providing for conflict of law, scrivener's errors, severability, and providing for an effective date. We'll now open the first public hearing. Becky? Okay. All right. This is an ordinance which would, um, we have 
a current um, ordinance relating to temporary placement permits, but this is to clarify the intent of the previous one, and this includes um, temporary commercial uses, and this allows um, its prospective in application, which is important because there are some um, uses which are here which were not pre in we're not kicking them out, which would result in claims against the town. Um, but this would allow going forward, um, I know that there were some questions as to whether there could be temporary commercial structures here under the existing provisions. Okay. Questions for Nancy? Nancy, sorry. Becky? It's okay. Councilor King? None. Vice Mayor Holt? Well, I appreciate that explanation, Becky, but if you were walking into a coffee shop this morning and somebody said, what are you doing? What are you working on today at the council? Could you explain this in a little bit, maybe okay. use an example so people can understand exactly what the impact of this would be? Okay. All right. Under the existing um, provision that we have right now, it talks about governmental and residential. And it, from, um, I wasn't here, but immediately after Ian, there was the understanding it would also include commercial because people whose commercial businesses were wiped out by Ian, um, they wanted to come back in using some kind of a portable structure or whatever that they could operate um, so that they, you know, could, while they were planning on rebuilding the brick and mortar, they would have a source of income going forward. Um, the, actually, the wording of what we, um, what we have on the books right now talks about governmental and it talks about residential. I don't know why it didn't have commercial in there, but it was always construed to be that. And I know that the town, um, particularly wants going forward to allow businesses that had um, a, a presence here to be able to have a temporary presence while they're rebuilding. And so that's so Becky, what the purpose you're doing of in it. essence, if I could just characterize it, you're just codifying the original intent of the council, yes. which was not Thank properly you. codified when it was produced by the yes. prior attorney. That's accurate. All right. Thank you. Councilor Woodson. So just for further clarification, um, if there was a business, let's just say a retail place, and they wanted to take their spot and put a food truck on it, that would not be the same business that they had prior to the storm. Is that is that like a carte blanche on this, or does it have to be same business so a restaurant could have a food truck a retail could have a pop-up kiosk or whatever it may be but it has to be the same business because that was originally the intent that i remember okay um the way this is written it's um or a similar business um i i that that doesn't that to me wasn't the intent and the other questions that I'm getting is okay if I had a rental property and it was destroyed and I want to put up a um, RV trailer whatever and rent it as a short-term rental because that was my business on that property before and I don't think we've addressed that either. Okay, um, I believe on the residential, um, it it very specifically what we have right now says uh, you can't use it for a short term rental. Okay. If, it, it under uh, I think to expand on what you're asking, in our code, does it say that if you have, if I'm not mistaken, three units or more? 
that are used that is considered commercial even though on lipa it may say it's residential but according to our code it's considered commercial that's They're not saying no no It's just considered multifamily at that point. It's it may have to meet the commercial building codes, but by zoning, it's still residential. Okay, that's that's the difference. Is the, yeah. the building codes would yeah. be considered commercial, but not the zoning. That's correct. Okay. Um, and to speak to your question regarding um, similar uses, uh, when we were drafting this new one, it was decided there are some businesses who are not interested in coming back, and that property was previously a restaurant, and they're allowed to put another restaurant there another temporary restaurant or you know a retail store maybe they just they can't do it but if somebody else wants to come in with a very with a similar business so that's so the idea is to keep the same uses there we're hoping that the same businesses come back but in the instance they don't we don't want the property owner to be out and say well i don't i don't have that business anymore so nothing can go there so that was the intent of that so okay, using that idea. So if it's a if it was a retail business, and shop, apparel shop or whatever, and they're not going to come back, they then could or could not put a food truck there. No, they would have to put a similar business. Okay. Um, so it'd have to be sort of a similar category business. It is going to be difficult for staff in some instances to determine what was previously there, especially if there was, a, um, you know, like a strip center and we're not really sure of what all the uses were in there. It might be difficult for staff to determine that. But the intent is that if there was a restaurant, a restaurant can go back. If it was retail, retail can go back. Okay, so I mean, I really believe if staff can't determine, because I understand that we have new people and that type of thing, that there should be some check and balance as to what was there before, asking the question, going online, doing. And it, what I'm trying to get at is to protect our businesses that were here mm -hmm. and not face competition as they're trying to build back too. Yes, no, and, and we're certainly going to do everything that we can to determine what was there using, I mean, they should have applied for use permits, so we should have a record of that, but in some instances, it's kind of hard to tell what was in certain places. Um, but we are going to do our best to understand what was there using Google Maps, using a variety of sources, um, just letting you know that it's not always perfectly clear. For example, the goods. Um, you know, they had multiple things going on inside that business. Mm -hmm. If you didn't go into that business, you wouldn't have known. Um, so, you know, I, for instance, I've been here a long time. I've never been into the goods. <laughs> so if somebody said there was ice cream it's there, I would have been like, really? I wouldn't have known that. Um, so just, just saying that we're going to do our best to understand what that business was, and we'll ask a lot of questions, but that, that is a hurdle that we'll have to work with. To your point, Council, we're also um, implementing what we're calling administrative review. So everything that comes in, we have, for lack of a better word, a little, a little get together and discuss this so this does not happen. Uh, to Sarah's point, using everything at our uh, availability to determine what was there and if it does meet the use category. So what about the businesses or the food trucks that have already been allowed that probably shouldn't be there? Again, it's more than just food truck. I mean, there's all kinds of businesses being yeah, used exactly. on land that wasn't what it was used was for before. There before. So my bigger question is, are we setting ourselves up for litigation by doing this because of our favorite Senate Bill 250? We're changing the rules now again, and we're making it more restrictive than what was there originally. Because if I can tell you, it's, if I was a person that owned a piece of commercial property and I'm seeing this, I would be extremely upset because... Other people have it now on the island that didn't have things in that location and doing a different use than what was before, and now you're telling me that I can't do it. Could I make an argument that I'm you're restricting my ability to operate my commercial business how I see fit? Um, the existing uh, provisions that we have right now don't address commercial at all. So this is actually, I could make an argument in court, I think, you know, you never know how a court case will no, I, come I just, out. Yeah. But um, when the, what we have right now talks about residential and governmental, <clears throat> doesn't address commercial. 
they the fact that we um, I'm not sure who drafted that I, I assume it was the former attorney but he apparently did not draft it in accordance with the the council's request but in fact what he drafted didn't address commercial so we're making it actually more liberal oh, okay. so I mean that would be my position in court you know there's an argument on the other side um, you know that in fact the town did allow certain things but that could be scratched up to human error Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in on no, you. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> on your, your no, I'm very sensitive to SB 250. Um, I I don't try to get um, obviously I don't yeah. try to get the town in trouble because I have no <laughs> desire to defend stuff. But when this is what you want to do, and this is I've got a good legal argument, you know, hey, if somebody sues, they sue, and we defend. So. Anything else, Council Wilson? Nope. Council Staff? Nope. The only couple things I had were one I've already stated and you answered that, but the other one was didn't we talk a little bit about there's got to be an end to this at some point? And and and, and what made me think about it is there's a, a property on the island that I know has submitted a develop a, a CPD or development to do something that is extremely outrageous and I'll be shocked when it actually comes through but based on our discussion would that then eliminate them from having to do anything with their structure that is totally dilapidated and not being touched we'll get to that later um, <laughs> and it's sitting there but now because they've put an application to do something does that give them the right to let that thing sit there forever based on what we have in front of us today or, or are we not putting anything in place to I mean it's got, we can't That's let something temporary it's, it's, right? it's, it's a different issue but specifically to this, we had talked about putting an end date to it, the temporary use, unless you had put in an application to build a new building to do it. That's what my recollection was of the last right. discussion yeah. about this. But I don't yeah, is see there a any, sunset on that, this? That's what I'm trying to get at. If there's no sunset on it, mm. and within that sunset, if someone just comes in and throws some ridiculous thing out there just <clears throat> to put an application in so that they don't have to take care of their okay. property, there's no recourse in here. To, to get someone to do something or does that get covered under a totally different statute? I, I, I think that is touching two different things because one could be a public safety versus one is giving the right to have somebody do what they want or extend a business so if they have a dilapidated structure even though they're putting through an agreement mm -hmm. it's still if, if it qualifies as an unsafe structure that that's a totally different game and we can go after them and which we but, are well that's uh, a good way to that, put it is, is how I want to make sure one doesn't supersede the other. No, sir. Meaning yeah. you're giving the person the, the ability to do something versus the ability not to conform are two different issues. <coughs> you look like you want to say something. Becky. <laughs> um, this actually, we didn't put a specific sunset in this because we wanted, if heaven forbid, there's another storm and we are faced with this again, this would give us a way to to deal with that eventuality but we could sunset a hurricane we can, Ian we issue can, yes or an Adelia issue yes. until the next or issue. does it have to get yes. that granule can it be yeah. not storm specific but you have after the date of said storm you have this much time where this is a play is applicable you know what I mean we could yeah, yeah. yeah. but that way it doesn't Tell have me. to be changed Tell me the amount of time, and I'll well, we stick it in for a second We reading. had discussed three years, three years to three coincide years with from the, from what, the storm because of what is in the Senate Bill 250 as far as right. the residential well, I side. I thought it was two, two years, but we're, it's still two years, isn't it? Well, no. That's, we, did we it, talked did about, it move to three years now? It was sure. three, It was 18 months originally, and then it's now three it's years now through Senate right. Bill from, from, okay. from the date of the storm. For so, residential. For residential, but right. we had talked about doing that Commercial. with... The entire ordinance, so that it would give them till September of 2025 to be able to 
provide application. Yeah. And that's where my question came in with yeah, the application. Yeah, I'd like to see that in there, actually. So it's another year and a half. Just so there's certainty. Well, and it, and it gives people enough time to understand that this is, mm -hmm. you know, this is your window of trying to do something. Because the intent, as far as I remember our discussion, was to not allow this forever, to not let someone right. just right. have right. something and I, sit I've there actually right. spoken to business owners, and they appreciate that there's a sunset clause in there. So they can make a decision. They can move forward. Mm -hmm. They've got a game plan. So it's it's not like we're making a rule that is is bad. It's, it's actually a good thing because they can they can make plans and and move forward. Does that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So is everyone okay with adding that? I guess you want to call it sunset clause. Okay. And and would it be worded as though? So that this can stay in place unless it has to be amended at some other point, not specific to Ian, but any Name storm, storm, any right. hurricane. But then do, I, say I that. think, yeah, well, yeah. Just exactly. <laughs> and I don't want to bring bad thoughts. Yeah. I just want to make sure that, that, the, you know, that we don't have to go through this all over again. So that we mm -hmm. have it, something right. in place that people know going into it or coming out of it, unfortunately where they stand as far as and, getting back on their feet. And, and I think it probably would need to have a provision that talks about um, a resolution kind of re-upping it. Well, could we say instead of giving a sunset date to coincide with state statute? Because if Senate Bill 250 were to get extended, we would have to then change this to meet the state statute, wouldn't we? Yes. So maybe the wording is okay. to coincide with the state whatever this that way if something changes we don't have to do this all over again um except that there has not been yeah there hasn't been anything <clears throat> i don't think i've missed anything um relating to commercial at all it's just residential mm -hmm. so do you want the commercial to tag along with the residential because that might not be a great idea because who knows what they're going to do with residential yeah sp 250 is just strictly yeah and i understand yeah. but i you're talking about when you say tag along, you mean the yeah. sunset date or? Mm -hmm. In other words, if for whatever reason they extend it and yet another two years for a total of five years, I don't think you want to do that with the commercial. commercial. Okay. So that could you commercial. do it separate? You could do yeah. residential as to coincide with state statute. Mm -hmm. Commercial is up to three years after the date of name storm, something along those lines. Yeah. That sounds about right. No. Sure. I agree with that. <laughs> natural a, a, how about a name a name na, how about a uh, name natural a, a name how about a, a name disaster go. a name natural disaster it doesn't have how to about, be a na natural because the plane crash not is not about, natural a name a, disaster disaster yeah, yeah. How, how about well i don't know if they name plane crashes but um <laughs> if, but a disaster recognized by resolution just, just of so you the know it, it does happen Six months after the building collapse, a plane crashed on Collins Avenue and, and outside of Surfside. So it does happen. Just well, when you least expect twice. it. Yeah, wow. we just had one crash in, in April, Naples, yeah. in 75. That's true. Well, I think you understand are kind you of still there, the, yeah. where we're going with it. Are you okay. in Vice Mayor Adderholt, you look like you're in deep thought and would like to say <laughs> no. I think this has been a good discussion. I support the changes. Councilor King, are you okay with the changes? I am most certainly okay with them. Okay. Okay. You got what you need? Yes. Okay. The, the, the discussion got discussion. a little dark there for a while. But. We have to make a motion still. <laughs> well, we got to do public comment. Oh. oh. I'll open it up for public comment. Would anyone like to add their two cents into the discussion? Come on up. It's only related to this item, just so that we... Yes, sir. Matthew state... Thornton, somewhat retired 40-year contractor in several states, including the state of Florida. A couple of things that I'd like to say about this resolution and something that you, you might want to put in there. Uh, looking at it from the standpoint of a contractor, you're looking at several different things. You start basically by putting the idea out there, working with engineers and working with architects. I think there should be a proof that this is moving forward and then give it a sunset date after the proof has been amended or approved at some point. In other words, what you're doing is putting a sunset date in there, but what, what happens to the contractor and what happens to the commercial building when the contractor's gone in, put the documents in place, started with engineering, 
started with architecture, working on LPA, trying to get approvals, and then all of a sudden that sunset clause comes in. There has to be something in there that states that there has to be some kind of movement in this. And if you don't, then what you're going to end up with is, you know, just putting it out there as a contractor. Engineering can take a year, year and a half. Sometimes, you know, if you've got to look for the three-eyed lizard toad or something, you know, that somebody put out there, or some bug, it might take way longer than that. Because then you have to go back and you have to look at what's the environmental impact. So what, I'm, what my suggestion is, and I'm saying this for commercial, as a commercial contractor, you <coughs> need to put verbiage in this so that they're putting something forward. They're not just getting three years as a lump time because you're going to run out. It's not enough time. In other words, give them something so that they can move it forward. And if they need more time, it gives them that voice of more time. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, you, yeah. You got it? Okay. You're good. Anyone else like to speak in public comment? Oh, we got a public comment at the end. Um, all right, we'll close the public comment, bring it back to to address his issues. That, that's what I was talking about at the beginning. We had talked originally about having to move forward. The sunset was there to make sure that you're trying to move forward, to you putting in some sort of application. We understand it. it's going to take time. Yeah, but just, if, just for clarification, it's not three years from today. It's three years from, from the date of the storm. Correct. So we're, we're at 12, a year and a half. Year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. halfway through the, the the period and that was what i was trying to bring up at the beginning and understand it maybe it's a different issue but if i own property a and i come in on the the <coughs> second to the last day and say here's my here's my thing for sarah and, and the staff to look at and it's 50 story building on a quarter acre lot it's so ridiculous that but they've technically have put something in yeah. you know what i mean how, how do you safeguard against that because we, I think we've, the intent for the discussion that I remember was we certainly want to encourage people to brick, build back brick and mortar, but we don't want to give them something to just say, I'm not going to do anything and leave it sit here until it sells, so I'm just going to throw something in and pay the fee so that I'm technically no longer on the, sun, or the, the sunset list. You know? so you, I'll that's, address that. You're, that's in your wheelhouse. Absolutely. Is everybody okay with that? I mean, that's, I think that was the intent. Because we've now seen one that has come in that is is pretty egregious, I will say. And does that then take them off the we're trying to do something list? Or off the list, you know what I mean? So that's kind of what I was looking I'll at. I'll address that here. All right. Any further discussion? Is there a motion to move, uh, where are we at? Ordinance 2404, emergency temporary uses, to a second reading. I'll move the ordinance 2404. Emergency temporary uses to a second reading. Second. Uh, motion by Mayor Aller, seconded by Councillor King. Any further discussion? Uh, roll call. Um, aye. Councillor King? Aye. Vice Mayor Adderholt? Aye. Councillor Woodson? Aye. Councillor Safford? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> Next is the last public hearing. It is the first reading and public hearing on an ordinance entitled in an ordinance of the town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida reaffirming its prior amendment to the qualifying period for town council candidates for the November 2024 election to noon on the 71st day, June 10th, 2024. You skipped skip 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 purchasing policy. Oh, I did. I'm sorry. Let me go backwards. <laughs> Gee, I got two things here. Huh? Just kidding. Just warming up. Well, I'm glad you guys let me get halfway through it before you stop. <laughs> We were testing. We thought you we were testing. Yeah. I, my peripheral vision wasn't working because I would have been able to see you guys doing. What <laughs> All right. Let's try this again. This is the first reading and public hearing of an ordinance entitled "An Ordinance of the Town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, Amending Division One, Purchasing of Goods and Service Policies and Procedures of Article 
five, finance of the town of Fort Myers Beach to transfer purchasing to the town manager or designee from the finance department to increase the authority of the town manager for purchases of goods and services to clarify existing regulations and to implement reg recommendations provided to the town based on the disaster readiness assessment and abatement plan prepared by the Florida Division of Emergency Management, providing for a conflict of law, Scrivener's errors, and severability, and providing for an effective date. I'll now open the public hearing. Who's going first? This, uh, Mr. Mayor, this is something Who that... Who are you? Uh, my name is Frankie Krupacic. I'm the Operations and Compliance Director nice to meet for you, the sir. Town of Fort Myers Beach, sir. <laughs> um, members of Council, uh, this is something that we've been trying to work with, with uh, Nancy's kind of taking the spearhead on this one. And uh, we've just tried to uh, modernize this to give us, our town and our town manager, uh, a little bit more flexibility in these situations and to make us more concurrent with uh, other municipalities in the area with the help of staff like our finance director um, and with uh, Jason Freeman, our legislative liaison, who's uh, working with uh, our FROC uh, initiative and our abatement plan. We wanted to get something that had a little bit more teeth in it, but still gave us the flexibility to be competitive with other municipalities in the way they go about purchasing goods and services. Was this a recommendation from the FROC process, their abatement? review type of thing or it was, was it? um our our current purchasing policy was not that it was outdated it was just subpar compared to other municipalities um and with efrock you get a point system for updating being concurrent following different statutes and things uh this brings us into that realm um and basically what we did we shadowed uh the county's uh 18-22 purchasing ordinance and scaled back then from there to create uh, the basis of this and then also with some revisions from our finance director, um, which were really well taken, mm -hmm. um, put in there and given us the the meat, so to speak, in the ordinance. So this would this would increase our point total in the FROC program. That is correct. By sir. making this change, okay. And what is just for those that don't maybe understand what FROC is? Stereo ninety eight FROC. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's K-Rock. Uh, <laughs> I do have our legislative it's liaison here. east or west uh, of the Mississippi. Jason, if you'd like to come up and uh, just give us a real quick oh. yeah, just on the quick overview of what it is yeah. and, and how it, it, the point system is very important to uh, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jason Freeman, for the record. So FROC is the Florida Recovery Obligation Calculation. Uh, it's a new initiative with FDEM. I believe we're in the middle of the first opt-in year. Uh, and essentially, they go through... Uh, pre or I guess yeah they they do a review um, before emergencies or or disaster events, um and check procurement procedures and debris removal and a bunch of different public assistance uh, efforts and then they give you a score um, and we're in the middle of we had our initial score um, and now we're in the abatement plan or abatement activity uh, section of that process which we have until May fifteenth to update procurement ordinances and uh, policies <coughs> and procedures. I'm going to provide those to FDEM to get our final score for the hurricane season uh, starting in June of this year. Um, and the higher the score, the more money up front that you can receive for uh, public assistance in the future with FDEM. That's the important part I wanted you to yes. get out. <laughs> so, yeah, um, and they give you a baseline score. Um, and that's So we don't know our final score yet up until after May 15th, uh, once uh, the Division of Emergency Management reviews all of our abatement activities and we provide everything to them. Uh, we should have that score, and then we'll let you all know what that is. But, yeah, the higher score you have... Uh, the more money up front you can get in Category A and Category B, so it's debris removal and then uh, I think uh, yeah, emergency measures. So, so it's very important. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Wing. And so basically, when this process is done, not only for the FROC but also for the town moving forward, it gives the town manager a lot more flexibility into due to the day-to-day -day operations that we need to do. Okay. Any other questions for Frank or I have I would just Frankie or Andy, I appreciate the process importance of this and, and, and affirming with other certifications and so forth and how we're evaluated. But what what's the practical policy changes here? In other words, does the town manager now have authority to spend more than twenty five thousand? I mean what, what are there any aside from the process update piece here? And sort of good practices or best practices. Are there any are there any substantive changes that a vendor should know about, or th that we should know about in terms of what how we empower our town manager? So yes, to your question, Mr. Vice Mayor. Um, moving forward, this would allow a better or a larger spending limit initially to the town manager. 
um, based on where he's at right now. I believe we're bumping it up considerably. All right, from 25000 currently uh, before coming to council, actually twenty four nine ninety nine, um, now up to $75,000. Um, that's in line with all the other municipalities in the area, um, and that gives us a larger ability to do the things that we need to do at a moment's notice. We still always come to council, and we still always do keep the public uh, advised on what we do and how we do it. Um, as far as contracts for goods, services, those type of things. Our whole contracting system, too, is the way we wrote contracts and what we provide in those contracts and how we keep those public or get those to the public uh, as far as our vetted services will also be more, uh, they were always transparent, but a little bit more visible, so to speak. Um, there'll be a, a bigger area for them to be viewed um, on our town website moving forward. So all of our purchasing policy, again, will mirror sort of what the county did when they established the 18-22 purchasing policy, but it'll just be scaled down to fit our town. So currently the town manager is authorized to spend up to $25,000 without council approval. And is that $25,000, is he required to, or he or she required to go out to bid? It depends on what we're doing. If it's just for a simple service or even for a maybe a professional contract and it's a one-off, we do not. Um, if it is something that is going to benefit or uh, we are going to use it as a lasting service, then we always try to, uh, to put it out for bid. And then that 20, in essence, what happens after, if, if this should be approved, is that 25,000 number moves to 75,000? That is correct, sir. And you're, you're also telling us that in municipal government in Florida today, that 75,000 number is more common than the $25,000 number? <laughs> yes, sir, it is. Okay, that's, what I, that's helpful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any other questions? All right, we'll open it up for public comment. Anyone like to speak on this item? Seeing none, we'll close public comment, bring it back for any further discussion or a motion. <laughs> Mayor, if I may add, yes. um, we also go through the budget process every year. We try to anticipate what's going to be spent during the year. That A lot of this falls into that category where you've already <coughs> approved uh, Concrete purchase for, for, for uh, this is simple because we talked about concrete for a certain project. And it's, you know, and we know we're going to do that project and we anticipate it costing, you know, $73,000. Well, that kind of gives us the, me the ability to go ahead and do that, get the quotes, do whatever we need to do to follow the purchasing pro policy. But if there's something outside of that, it'll always come back to the council. We won't just do that if it's not a budgeted related item. It's very rare. Obviously, we've just come through probably the worst, you know, 18 months that, that a town could ever go through with that type of thing. But being under the emergency order, that opens everything up. It, that puts this aside, and there's things we can do. We're still in that. We still have the emergency orders. We still got have that going on from Ian. But we still, that just says that we, we can, I can do that, make a contract, do whatever. But I still have to follow the purchasing process and still come to you to get to approve everything. It's just on a post versus a pre. But there's a lot of things. Our communication process is is extraordinary. I think um, we, I'm really fortunate to have a good communication with each one of you. And I think that helps when you purchase things, just to let you know what's going on. And, and you won't see, you know, 25 bathrooms showing up down through here. That, that, you know, aggregate cost is too much. But the onesies, things like that. But we'll still be letting you know. I know Joe's been, a, I think he's in here. Joe's been a big part of this. And I don't know if, Joe, if you have any comments or anything to add or bless it or uh but joe we we obviously included him in this we think it's very important that that the village looks at this internally before we bring it to you but we we do think it's a better way and plus notwithstanding the points that we get in the future for what what uh, is um fdm's pro program joe I'm sorry to put you on the spot but just to kind of you know close things out a little bit sure um i'm joe Onsick, director of finance I, I did review the changes. I'm not sure if you had received the updated changes that were made. They, they do have them. Okay, great. So but the most important thing is that we are always in compliance with our purchasing ordinance. And so I don't think that's changing in any way, shape, or form. It's just maybe changing some of the, the ranges um, for certain requirements. And I, I should have pulled this out. I think I got it. Oh, here we go. Okay, just to highlight some things. So, what we're we're trying to do is like purchases between the range of 
$10,000 and $75,000, they're always going to require three quotes, and, and those would be written quotes. Anything between $5,000 and $10,000 would require verbal quotes, um, and then anything under 5000 would only require one quote. Certainly people do the best they can to find the best prices. Always we don't seem to have any issues with that. But then this just makes the parameters more... Um, more reasonable um, in, t in terms of um, the, the amount of work and effort that people have to go through when they're doing purchases. So we just trying to bring it back up. Um, these were my recommendations based on what I've seen, like in, for example, our neighboring um, uh, Sanibel, um, that, that this is, comes from, from what they're doing as far as these, these smaller um, ranges, changes to the ranges that I've suggested. So, and basically, it's just making sure that all the language within the purchasing orders is consistent. And so that was the only thing I did. So it's just between the town manager, myself, with Amy, all the people involved in looking at it, we were just trying to make sure that we're consistent and that um, it's it's reasonable. Very good. <coughs> Thank you, Joe. I, I don't want to belabor this, but just for the just for the public who are watching this, one of the things that's been somewhat I think it just hasn't been discussed very often uh, since I've been on the council, is the selection advisory committee process. That's referenced in this as well. Can you talk a little bit about how you go about finding these people to serve on the selection advisory committee and how that process works and is it a sort of an additional safeguard in the process? So basically what we do is we, we the town manager would select three directors um, to look over the qualifications of the people that were bidded. So say you had uh, three people putting in for uh, balloon manufacturing, and we're getting in the balloon business. We would look through what they had to have qualifications. Did they meet the basic criteria that we put out into our, our, our bid document? Um, and then they're scored. And that evaluation of that recommendation then gets back to the town manager and that town manager either proceeds. I guess or not. where I'm curious, Frankie, is that I've seen situations with the town where they have, they're not just directors, these are people, these are residents of our island, they're brought onto the selection uh, advisory committee. How is that, how, is this, how does that work? Are these just people that you know in the community? No, that these might are people that are maybe expert? pertinent involved in that activity. If we're looking for a specific type of vendor um, and it has a group involvement with it, um, we would definitely reach out to those groups and have one of those members on that committee as well. It, it's at the discretion of the town manager, but we do try to, to keep everyone involved that is in that active process. Um, if it's just a town function and it's a town service or town good that we're trying to meet, then it's usually just directing staff. But if it's an overall large project that we're going to put and we do need that public input, we would look out to those uh, uh, community groups and whatever for their help and the town manager would more than likely have several people of those uh, on that committee as well okay that, that helps it's just it's, it's an area that is rarely ever discussed and and i don't i don't know if you have a rolodex of people that if you've come across who have you know their subject matter expertise and you just sort of randomly select them when it's an outside issue like like frankie described or do you have, how do people, if people want to participate in that process, they should, they let you know. Obviously, they wouldn't, they certainly wouldn't want to have a conflict of interest. Correct. Yeah. yeah I think what, what, what I've, I've seen in the past hasn't happened here because we haven't done too many deep dives into construction or purchase of land, for instance, that type of thing. But I know in, in the, I'm not sure what they did in the past, but I don't, I don't have a Rolodex. I'm still learning a lot of people, but we depend on people that are, say, on uh, BORCAB. Uh, maybe a committee member there, somebody from Anchorage Committee, if we're doing something related to that. Um, we, 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 Murph, if we're doing beach-related type things, it would just be makes common sense to do that. Uh, you're right, have to watch conflict of interest. That That's another thing. Uh, we don't really have a procedure, I, I don't think, in, in place now. It's pretty much a, okay, we do, we'll do deal with staff. Maybe the attorney sits in there, the clerk. Um, the finance director and then the director of the department they they look at that to make it more broad based um, currently how we do that but it's always uh, opportunity to expand it to make it more user friendly for the whole community make it more um, transparent that sort of thing so we, we do uh, record those I believe Amy if that's correct those recordings everything has to be recorded uh, we keep it in the sunshine keep it uh, as, as as open as we can can keep it 
And that's the selection advisory committee process is optional to the town manager, or is there a threshold where you have to institute one? It looks like it. It looks like it for any bid greater than two hundred fifty thousand, you have to have a selection advisory committee. Is that? In there, that number. That's. And on any capital projects. I think the only thing we had was the tier one project that we did, the stormwater project. And I think that was we had people involved that were subject matter experts in that field. Okay. All right. Thank you. I think I, as long as Joe's sitting up close again, um, obviously you were involved in this, so you're comfortable with this. But remove the current occupants from the position. Is that something that you'd still be comfortable with? Are there safeguards in there that, uh, as a finance director, you'd be okay with? In terms of moving the purchasing from finance department, well, actually, I mean, in practice, that's that's sort of. But happened. also the amount but as well. The amount. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'm the not increase. understanding. Your, oh, the, inc the increase, increase in the amount. Yes, I'm I'm comfortable with that. In fact, the main I mean the main thing for for grants and for um, like FEMA and that they actually have much higher levels like on a federal level, so our our levels are are below what they would require so and and it's comparable to what you know our neighboring um, municipalities are doing so I, I am comfortable with that okay thank you any further questions for staff mayor I'll move ordinance 24-11 purchasing policy amendments second I had a motion by Councilor King seconded by Vice Mayor Adderholt any further discussion uh, Councilor King aye Vice Mayor Adderholt aye Mayor Adderholt says aye Councilor Woodson? Aye. Councilor Safford? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Now for take two. Hmm. This is the first reading and public hearing on an ordinance entitled an ordinance of the town of Fort Myers Beach, Florida, reaffirming its prior amendment of the qualifying period for the town council candidates for the November 2024 election to noon on the 71st day, June 10th, 2024, to noon of the 67th day of June 14th, 2024, prior to the August primaries to be held on August 20th of 2024, providing for Scrivener's errors, conflicts of law, severability, and providing for an effective date. We'll now open the first public hearing. Becky? Okay, um, this is to um, fulfill the request of the Supervisor of Elections. This is not a change of anything. The supervisor of election has asked us to um, have this ordinance. Okay. Questions for Becky? Then? This doesn't really move anything then from the it town does. clerk to the supervisor of elections? Um, we currently have an interlocal with the supervisor of elections that they are our qualifying officer now. That was signed back in, I believe, December of last year. Okay. So this is just clarifying because they are our qualifying officer now. We run on their schedule, no longer on ours. It moves it back from election day. The 67, 71 days is from primaries. So it's um, better for them to get the, the ballots printed and overseas ballots mailed and get those mail-in ballots back. But also as a candidate, all forms then go to the county instead of to you? We believe that is the correct answer. We're gonna clarify that this afternoon. I've had that question just this morning. All right. I, I think there's a little confusion on the county website on that, John. Uh, just. <coughs> okay. Any other questions for? Amy or Becky. Uh, we'll open it up for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to speak and public comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll close it and bring it back to the council for any discussion or a motion. I'll move ordinance 24-12 elections. Second. All right. We've got a motion by Councilor King, a second by Councilor Safford. Any further discussion? Councilor King? Aye. Councilor Safford? Aye. Councilor Woodson? Aye. Mayor Allers, aye. Vice Mayor Adderall? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Next is the administrative agenda. I don't believe there's anything. Anyone have anything administratively? No? Final public comment. This is your time to shine. I'm Christy Thornton from Trip and Rides. I came here 
um, probably a couple months ago now. Um, I brought you a flash drive. I left it with you. So while I've been um, rerouting my map plan and drawing things out, and actually there was a really good um, um, public discussion opened up on Facebook about a comment that I made in the interim while we're redesigning the traffic flow here with the roundabout and everything, I came up with an idea that maybe the southbound traffic on Estero Boulevard could first use the bus lane coming over the bridge and then turn um, left and use the middle lane going down Estero Boulevard. That would keep a one-way flow of EV, bikes, golf carts, or regular bikes if they can keep up the flow of traffic. And then they could turn around um, down at Virginia Street and come back up the sidewalk opposite the beach end um, in the interim until we build a roundabout. That would give electric vehicles on the beach a way to travel around with traffic and not hold up anything. While I was drawing this out, I came up with another idea, which um, this is my husband, Matt, is holding this map, which you all have here. A long-term solution to trying to fix the flow of traffic going around that little square by Times Square in between Crescent um, Drive and Old San Carlos Boulevard. I propose that we make a one-way flow of traffic after you come to the base of the tri the bottom of the bridge, make a one-way flow of traffic that comes up to Margaritaville and the right-hand lane would go straight. The left-hand lane would be forced to turn left down Crescent and make a loop around and you have a series of networks of one-way flow traffic so that you don't have any bottleneck and choke points because we are stuck with the, bo the choke point at Margaritaville currently. There's no way around this. So instead of having the northbound traffic come up and be subject to the pedestrian traffic at Margaritaville, which is absolutely necessary that we have a light and a crosswalk there. Every time that crosswalk is activated, the northbound traffic has a free flow right-hand turn down Crescent and then up on the bridge, and they bypass this whole mess, this corner. And if you look at your map here, I've drawn in this roundabout that you're all about to put in, um, and I've incorporated I think is a network of flow of traffic that is um, compatible with electric vehicles, compatible with bikes, compatible with pedestrians, and compatible with cars all in the same way. And I think it, if we could make this beach more accessible to electric vehicles and pedestrians and bicycles, a lot less people would drive here anyways. So that's my two cents. I hope you, and I, oh, in the meantime, I'm really looking for access to use the bus lane up over the bridge for electric vehicles and golf carts. All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and the middle lane, down Astero. Well, if you want to hang out, I'll address some of the concerns that I have with this okay. for your benefit, in case okay. you don't know. I'll, I'll address it under my okay. items. Yeah, Anyone else like to speak in public comment? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Tom, manager items. Thank you, Mayor. I have a few things. Um, first, we'll talk about staffing. Uh, we continue to work on staffing. Um, we have a, an interview on Thursday, uh, Tuesday with, with what's the title? Uh, Harbor Master. Harbor Master, sorry. It just slipped my mind. Um, also, the discussion I had with the planner, it looks like uh, she's going to take a job somewhere else. So we're back at square one, but Sarah and I continue to talk about, you know, planners and things like look, how we can do this, how we can have somebody in-house to help. She's looking, we're looking, so we continue to keep that in front of us. Um, we got a going to be putting a budget calendar out in front of you very soon. It's getting to be that time of the year. Joe and I have already been talking about this. Uh, we should have, uh, you know, received tentative property appraiser value by June 1st. And then we will continue to discuss this at MMP, uh, or excuse me, at council on June 3rd, MMP on June 6th, and council meeting on June 17th um, going forward. Um, we, we may need to discuss the the seven uh no, i think we're good with the seven the, the june meetings yep we're good all right just thinking of 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 people being here um strategic planning we continue to work to get get someone to come in to lead us with strategic planning planning we should have that down nailed down today but right now the 20 i believe it's the 29th 
is the date, so we'll get more out in the next day or so f- for that. I think the big thing in the elephant in the room is 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 our uh, FEMA National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, Kristen's <coughs> here. Um, we've we've kept I've kept you apprised of what's been happening. We've got a lot of work to continue to do. We feel like we've done a lot of work. We feel like we've answered all of their questions to this point. We have a, a representative coming in tomorrow to meet with staff tomorrow afternoon to meet with Frank, Kristen, and I. Uh, to discuss what we have have given them. There's been some concern that it, some of it never has even been looked at um, since we gave it to them back, um, not just from, from us, but from other municipalities and the county as well. Andy, just to clarify, that, that it hasn't been viewed on their end, not on our end. FEMA's end, that is correct. Thank you, Mayor. Um, however, that having said that, we, we've asked for some more backup information. Uh, it was supposed to be a Friday. It showed up at 520 on Saturday afternoon, and this morning we could not access the information that came from FEMA. It was more of the windshield review um, that they did by the Corps of Engineers immediately following the storm. So we continue to, to, to research that. Kristen's reached back out to them this morning to get that information what it what it i think what i think it boils down to and what i have been told and the first thing that i was told when i met with fema we, we met with fema last week um uh, what i believe it was last early last week was that we are basically fighting to stay off probation and then the tone changed a little bit the next day but now we seem to be back it was it's kind of volleying back and forth we won't know until we know. Um, they they are giving us a 30-day reprise, a 30-day window to bring them more information. I think that's till May 9th. So we continue to work. Obviously, with them not getting the information to us that we needed by you know uh, uh, earlier, we can't. I'm not pointing the fingers. Just we needed that information to be part of our information. So obviously, the, the clock's ticking. You know, so every day that goes by that they don't come. And, and look at a sampling of what we have to say, is this, is this what you expect? Is this what you expect? Is this? We think we have that information. We believe that we've given the documentation. So it is, we're there. I'm going to turn it over to Frankie a little bit, and he can, he can opine a little. And then um, uh, Kristen's here. If, if we have any additional questions, I, I, I'm sure we will have some more questions. Yeah, currently, the situation is not only on compliance, but also on uh, review. As far as structures, uh, we got out ahead of this back in October when um, Andy and I spent uh, some three or four weekends uh, cruising up and down the streets, compiling that uh, dreaded list of non-compliant structures. Um, at that point, when we sent those letters out, we didn't realize that a lot of these people were in the mitigation form uh, phase with FEMA and FDEM as far as raising their houses and getting them um, that. Those people have since uh, that were involved with that reached out to the town uh, back in October, November, and through December, saying, "Oh, wait a minute here, uh, this is our whole situation." Um, those were taken off the supposed list. Uh, both FEMA and us do not like the word "list" because it is actually a living document. It changes; it goes, it, it either grows or subtracts itself, um, and, and that's kind of where we're at with FEMA uh, with that. Um, as far as the town standard, uh, council has asked several times uh, where we at with a demolition, um, either RFP, RFQ, to take care of these unsafe structures. Uh, going back to staffing, uh, we had uh, a short period of time where we did not have a code compliant department. Uh, we're back up, but they are just getting their legs under them, so to speak, um, at which time talking with council, not the elected council, but legal council, uh, we found a different avenue to pursue with our building official and red tagging properties of unsafe structure. Um, and that's where we're currently at right now. Our current building official, Joe Specht, has taken the list that we have given him. He goes out in the field daily. He looks at these structures, and he is compiling his information. He, as the building official, has the authority to go on any property. He does not need... Uh, like where code would only be able to assess from the driveway uh, in legal means that way. Um, so he has been starting his list, um, and as far as how we're going to proceed, uh, we're looking at piggybacking off of two other communities. One was North Miami, who did the same demolition thing through their um, process, and the other one is Mid-State over by Ocala, where they had uh, hired a firm to come in and take care of unsafe structures um, after a tornado that went through that area. So between Nancy and I, we're currently going over those documents, and we have Joe Specked out in the field 
and we continue to take photographs with code. It all kind of falls into the same situation. FEMA has been requesting what plan did we have in place immediately after the storm, what place do we cur our, our policy do we currently have, and how do we fix it going forward. I think to address this on, on the FEMA's end, so you're all aware of it, um, right after the storm, they sent down the Army Corps of Engineers to do the window uh, surveys. Um, then it was expressed to me explicitly from FEMA that, uh, you know what, those Army Corps guys, uh, we don't follow what they write down. That's not in compliance with what we need. So my direct response was, well, then why did you send them? Why couldn't we have gotten people that could have actually done the job the first time instead of coming back months later and saying that this information is no longer good or sufficient? Um, their reply to me was, we do not have to answer those questions. Um, so uh, that was an open phone conversation that uh, the town manager overheard um, that I had. Um, we've kind of gotten a lot better at our communication over the past week and a half. Um, but at this point, until we actually see results from their end, it's <coughs> lip service. Um, so that's basically where we sit. I'll be free to answer any questions that I possibly can. No, go ahead. Frankie, when you use the term, the building official will red tag a property. How are you defining the term red tag? So this falls under the <coughs> a loophole in the Florida Building Code. It's, it's not a loophole in the building code. It's a loophole for us with FEMA. Um, so instead of having a code, an active code case out, some communities went out and actually um, NOV'd a notice of violation every single property on the list that they were given by, uh, by FEMA and then backtracked. Uh, City of Cape Coral comes to mind. They also have four, f over 40 code officers at their disposal. Um, so we had two. We subsequently uh, subtracted those two and added a new department. In the interim, what we had done is the building official has the authority to go out in any community at any time, and if he deems a property as an unsafe structure, there's X number of days that he communicates with that property owner, and at which time, if they haven't made compliance to that, that building can be written for demolition. And any unsafe structure is an inhabitable structure, a structure that uh, should not have anybody near it, could have some kind of contaminant uh, exposed, those type of things. And that is totally within his realm of obligation to do. So with the building official going out and red tagging structures, it's, it's accomplishing two purposes. It's satisfying FEMA's concerns, but it's also potentially ridding the uh, uh, island of eyesores and unsafe properties, right? That is correct, sir. Okay. Now, he has not, just so we're clear, he has not red tagged any properties as of yet. We are still trying to get clarification with myself and Nancy on how we need to pursue this and how we can tie it into the FEMA thing. So where there's a few questions out there on that. And then also, he has also been compiling the list off of what we gave him. <coughs> so that original hundred and some odd properties that Andy and I cited and took pictures of, uh, we had code go back out, take those prop, uh, pictures again. So if it went before magistrate, it, they were all time stamped and, and the photos would be acceptable for evidence. Uh, we are now saying, uh, being told from FEMA that a lot of this stuff is, a, a photo of a property is not evidence going in front of a magistrate. Um, that just puts that person in non-compliance for maintaining their property. What FEMA is looking for is actual action taken against that homeowner or that property. We we don't have the information that FEMA has that they promised to give us. So that that's part of that equation. This kind of simplifies it as far as the town goes and still meets all the requirements moving forward, not only with FEMA, but also with our compliance to the council as far as getting rid of the eyesores on the island, both residential and commercial, that have not been addressed yet. Okay. Councilor King, look like you want something to say. It's up. Still pondering. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Stafford? So I, I've been asked this by several people, this quote-unquote list, why is it not public? Can you tell me or tell our, tell us why it's not public? Because the federal government know. told us not to make it public. We've signed a document that says we cannot make it public. It's okay. a federal thing. It's not a town thing. Okay, thank you. Council Wilson, any questions on the the elephant in the room, I guess? No, it's one of those things I just roll my eyes. <laughs> well, the and just for the record, for clarification, the question has come up, and I believe I've answered it correctly, but I'll let you guys weigh in. 
of the list that we don't really want to refer to as a list <laughs> have all of the people that are on said list been communicated with or contacted with at one way or another knowing that they are on the list so the original compiling that Andy and I did and then turned it over to our code staff um, and then we sent those letters out in October uh, a majority of those people have reached back to us there are at least a handful I would say about eight or nine that are either out of country or have not lack of a, a better mailing uh, but we have um, tried to make contact with everyone that's on that list. contact and what we've done then in those cases where those letters have been sent back to us as non-deliverable we scan those in and keep that as part of our record okay that's all I wanted to make sure that I was communicating what I thought was correct. So um, I just have a quick question on that. So if they're non-deliverable, so what is the next step after that, or how are we trying to... The, the next step is if we were pursuing this just as the town, which that's the path that we we're originally going on before this whole FEMA thing started, was that we were going to go and, and, and get a firm to come in here and demo these properties and put a lien against those properties, Okay. And, and that's still pursuant with what we're, where the end goal would be. So you don't contact us. We make every effort by law to reach you. Mm -hmm. We still can go ahead and pursue that as a non-compliant property, unsafe structure that has to be taken care of. If you're not going to do it or we can't reach you to do it, we will do it and put that against that property. <coughs> All right. I so, guess for me, it's I'm trying to get it clear in my mind. We started out with this is what we want you to do and then it was sending letters and things like that then we moved to a quicker area of we don't need to go through all those hoops because we can now red tag but now we're not red tagging so i guess where are we so so there's actually two different things sir so to and they merge together and that's the that's okay. the odd part about this we were going down a path to take care of and address the structures as the town without FEMA's interference or with FEMA's looking over our shoulder at that point. We knew we had unsafe structures from the com complaints from the com citizens calling in, whether they be tall grass, a tree fallen and not been picked up, or houses that were just in really, really bad shape. We took it upon ourselves to compile those properties into a database. And that's the path that we went down as far as either trying to get them to comply with uh, through code enforcement actions like other communities have since Ian. Um, and, and again, not dealing with the FEMA elephant in the room, so to speak. Um, we chose, just because of our situation without staff, um, the, the path of least resistance was to ask the building official if he would, if this would fall into his purview, and it does. So that's where we're currently at. As long as he is up to the task, and he has been, um, just looking at the database that we had, there are properties that have come into compliance. In other words, they've taken those unstructured, uh, unsafe structures down on their own. And so when he gets his database uh, base that matches what he needs to do, that's when he will go and, and, and deem those properties. And w the whole process is not just putting a notice on the house that it's red tagged. You're making every effort possible to reach that homeowner or that property owner and let them know that you are not in compliance. Your structure is not habitable based on Florida law and, and how we intend to pursue. So those instructions will be made clear to those properties when that process starts. But it's two different processes. FEMA then comes in with the series of letters. This started back in, I believe, February of 2022 when they asked uh, town to make clarifications on a few things and addressed a series of letters that they sent out to municipalities. That's kind of where we're at with this one now. They're asking for... Uh, clarification on properties that they did with their boots on the ground uh, coming into communities without letting us know that they've been here and just looking at a structure and then all of a sudden asking hey what are you guys doing on this fortunately for us a lot of the structures seem to be and in, in, in what we know because that information has not been shared with us at this point but there is some generalities that a lot of the properties that we had taken the steps to ad address would be on their purview as well okay but I'm still trying to understand I guess it was originally this was the process letters whatever uh, and then we we're going to expedite it by red tagging yes but we're not red tagging so because we're not red tagging because we've reached received no. enough information that we, those we currently are going, going to red tag those properties sir yeah. well that's 
kind of where I am. Okay. Red tag or not red tag, um, because that was supposed to expedite this whole thing. <clears throat> and now know? we're not red tagging, but is that because people have become into compliance or we still need to jump through other hoops? Red tagging wasn't going to help the FEMA. It, 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 right. I'm not talking about the FEMA thing. No, okay. so it, the red tag is, is continuing, sir. But that, that's at, it, that's well, in the wheelhouse. We haven't red tagged anything, though. No, because we want to make sure that we do, we just can't go up to a property, even though we see it as unfit structure, and the building official may. We have to make sure that we have tried every. Set so the process. red tagging process didn't expedite anything, really. At this point, no, sir. It will. It will as far as taking the magistrate out of the the the, the, the mix, and it'll be more of a a, a state supported process because he's a, a he's. A registered building official with the state of Florida, not the town. So then we can eliminate that step and then go to removing those structures. Correct. And that's okay. what we had hoped to do in the beginning. Yes. All right. Thank you. So I'm, now I'm confused. So there's two separate lists. So we have a FEMA list and we have a town list. So can we make the town list public? It has been. It has been. So it's... Not addressed. Uh, no, not addressed. Okay, that's. The attorneys are told you can't put addresses out there. Okay. Well, what do you put? Just what, what it was. The clerk put it out. That passed her. We put a list. I, out. It's, it's, you, it's just super. It's it's super confusing for the for the public, and yeah. we want to be as transparent everybody, as possible. Everybody can see the places. I mean, it's not like a surprise. Well, you can drive around and see them, but you say the clerk. We have redacted addresses, correct, with information, correct? Correct. They get a letter, basically, in a either no attachment to it or a big black box covering the attachment on it. Um, it's not helpful at all, really. Not at all. Because of that privacy policy. Was it like HIPAA? I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I've made that. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just, just, yeah. Look, we're, we're getting questioned all the time. I mean... It's above us. It's above us. Well, so, Becky, so, can you, so there are two <laughs> lists that we can't. So there's a FEMA list and a town list, and nobody, because of privacy laws, can see those lists. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the attorney. I'm not an attorney. Yeah, the federal well, list we cannot touch. Yes. Huh? That's, that's what I understand. Correct. So it, it's it's not me. You know, poking the poking the bear. It's it's people are poking us all the time, saying what yeah, what's we didn't poke to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So well, they're worried. Are they on the list? And that's yeah, are that's they on that, the list. Is that's why I wanted to make sure that, you know, we've made just, we've uh, at least tried to make contact with everyone that is on whatever list you want to talk correct. about. Correct. If they're on our list, our list, they got a letter. Okay. If they're on FEMA's list, we can't do anything about that. FEMA has said we cannot publicize the no, list. No, 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 no. If the list that was provided to us from FEMA, those people have been notified yes. that. Yes. And I'm guessing that there's probably an overlap. Same of yeah. The same, the same people are on both lists. Remember, FEMA's looking at empty lots, too. They're not just looking at damaged structures out here. They're looking at empty lots as well. So people might not even realize that they're on the list. And it's not a list that I got your list with them. It's with the town. It has nothing to do with the two different lists are, are separate things. It's a, it's, a, it's a structure list, an unsafe structure list, which we started with. Frankie said grass and stuff. No, it's not grass and trees and stuff. It's an unsafe structure list. Okay. That's a different list. FEMA's doing other things. Houses are gone. Things are already done. It's that, and it's our documentation that supports that. There's two lists, separate. To they might not even be information on their list might be part of our list, not all of our list. Okay. Kristen, you look like you want to say something. I was just going to say the FEMA list is protected under the Federal Privacy Act of 1974. So that's why we're not allowed to submit or mm -hmm. publicly give out all the information. If we have our other lists, as Andy said, that we can we can provide that as long as it doesn't say, oh, this is what FEMA gave us. I don't want to say as long as it doesn't say. Our list is a completely separate list than what FEMA gave us. But, well, here, uh, I, okay, I, I, I appreciate that. But I guess here's what, to try to sum this all up. The people 
that either have unsafe structures or on FEMA's list have been contacted one way or another. We've tried to send them a letter. We've tried to do something to at least let them know that their st structure is unsafe, correct? Yes. So if that gets asked for from FEMA down the road, we have all that documentation already saying we've tried to do this. Right. My bigger question is when are we going to get the ball rolling? We've been talking about it for six months, and it was going to be in February, and then it was going to be in March, and now we're in April. And then, you know, when, when are these buildings going to come down? So, so to that point, it's not as simple as just getting a contractor in here to demolish the properties or having a building official or a code department and go through a magistrate. It's the legality of putting a, implementing a policy in place that you're physically taking down a structure and putting a price against that property owner. And I understand the process, and, Frank. And, and that's kind of what's been taking time to make sure that we get everything just right so it doesn't come back against uh, the town. And all I'm asking for is a realistic time frame. We've been told three different times now. We've given direction that this is a very high priority for the council. To, to get these unsafe structures down. Every day that they aren't taken down, there's a potential for someone to get hurt. Correct. Not only or that, it's, it's their, people are moving into these places. I mean, it's-, it's Yeah, a, there's, they're squatting. It's and they're squatters, yeah. there's- So if, if- All kind of stuff going on, I mean- what, If you're saying it's legal holding it up, put, not putting words in your mouth, but essentially it sounds like one side saying it's legal, one legal saying no, it's not, it's the building official. What There's a disconnect here, it seems like, that is going on and and people just want to know when are they going to stop looking across the street at a stove that's been open for 18 months and it appears as though the town is doing nothing and people are getting frustrated so if there's something legally that we can do why aren't we doing it or are we doing it and I, it's not as I understand the whole getting someone to come in and do it but when are we going to get to the point of your buildings coming down whether you like it or not I, I believe we're at that point sir but uh, <laughs> and, and, and it's not, and it's not, it's, it's Becky, not, not yeah. putting the, the, the ball back in, in legal's court at all. This is a discussion that we've made uh, on how we can pursue and if we can piggyback, if we have to put out for RFP. The quickest way to get this handled on that end of it, the quickest way to handle it and, and get the people to notify, again, of their unsafe structure would be with the building official. As far as things out that people are staring at, <clears throat> appliances, things like that, those will be code matters, and those have been starting to be readdressed. So notice of violations have increased exponentially in the last two months of what we can visibly see and physically take pictures of from the road or from a public right away. And those have been put into new categories and are being pushed through through magistrate. That's not how we want to pursue the unsafe structure part. As far as abandoned uh, cars, appliances, things like that, things that we can actually take and put in front of a magistrate, that's what those properties are NOV'd. We've NOV'd every single structure, commercial structure on a sterile boulevard, uh, regardless of if they've come back afterwards or not. There's Most of these people are still not in compliance. Wait, Frank, All I can Frank, do is, yeah, I've got a question. So yes, sir. You, you stated a couple minutes ago that a picture will not do anything with the magistrate, but you just said you're taking FEMA. pictures. A, a, so. pic, a, a, a picture of trash, a picture of a pile of mattresses, those type of things will go in front of a magistrate. But it's a separate issue from the structure itself. You may see a house that looks like it's bombed out, but the building official goes up there and says, you know what, this house is structurally sound. So I, you, all you have okay. to do is, I, is I, clean I, out. I, okay. But Thank only he the, has the authority to go on that property and do so. Code does not have that authority. Okay, right. the, the, where are we at with the building official doing that? Or do we need to give you more resources to no. allow another building official to help get this moving? Because if yeah. I understand he's very busy and he's one person. And if you're telling us this one person has got all of these hats on, to me that sounds like a lot of work for one person. And if it's going to delay it six months or a year from now, for him to be able to go out and determine red tag properties, is there anything that we can do to help expedite that, to give him help to be able to do that? We, we do have the resources available to us through the Jacobs Group for additional help on that. And Joe, like I said, has started going out in the field. The last two weeks he has made progress on getting out and looking at these structures. So that's two weeks ago that he's already compiled a list. Once he gets his list, he will go back. We will work up a letter with... Uh, our, our council, get that to the property owners by state laws, which we have to, and those those properties will come down. 
that's kind of where we're at, sir. No, I understand. I'm just a little frustrated because it seems like that was the same time frame that we were told three months ago. And now it sounds like it just started two weeks ago. But I was under the impression it had started months ago. And now it just started two weeks ago. My next question is, can it run concurrent? Can it? it we know how many can. people we have now. Can we start the process with them even though we're working on compiling the end of the list? I'm guessing you're going from one to the island to the other. It, it's just people, I'm telling you, people are getting extremely frustrated people that are trying to operate business, that are trying to draw people back to the island, right. who are trying to move back into yeah. their home, it and it like just that. appears like we're doing nothing. Right. We don't want to be the roadblock. We've identified a funding source to be able to pay for that, to be reimbursed when the properties are sold, after we put the liens on them. There's a lot to it that the attorneys have to do, and we, but, but we, will, we will make a, a better um, effort to get this uh, underway as soon as possible. So, Becky, you've been, you've been doing this for a while. You've stated this is because we had the international thing in place before the storm that we can put these letters out do we have a letter ready if not why not and can we get one ready quickly so that when they do have the red tags available that these letters can, can be supplied to them quicker it just it, to me i'm sorry i'm not trying to throw everybody to the bus here but it seems like we're, we're fighting against each other here on this issue and not making any headway and it's we don't have a letter we have a letter I, we don't need to let maybe I i'm maybe believe i'm over, we do yeah, have no. a letter yeah. We've we've oh, so we done do it. Have a letter. So it's that's ready to go. So if it's red tag, that letter can go out. And how much time from the time they receive that letter do they have to come into compliance before we can have a firm, which we haven't gotten yet, come in and remove that Ooh. unsafe structure? You have to look. I don't remember. I don't remember the number of days. Okay. It's 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 not a terribly long period of time okay. though. Yeah. Can we, by the, for the next meeting, can we get an update as to what sure. those days are, what the letter looks like, maybe provide a sample yes. of the letter of yes. here's what's going out to people, here's how many structures we've deemed now up to this date that are red tagged, they're going to be receiving this letter. I understand we can't, maybe we can't give out the, the addresses, which is fine. To me, that's not as important as they're getting what they need to understand that this process has started and you've got however many days it is to come into compliance or the bulldozer will take care of it for you. Good. Yes. Sorry, right, I didn't mean to jump up on a soapbox okay. there, but <laughs> just it's it's a it's a it's becoming a very heated conversation piece out there that we need to address. So. Where it is, right? I have one other item. Yes, sir. Um, it's only going to be on the Lee County Board of Commissioners tomorrow. It's the CDBG. Could I before we go on? Can I just ask just a procedural question? <clears throat> if I'm the owner of a, if I'm a bad actor and I'm an owner of one of these properties and I've not been responsive, that sounds like you. <laughs> First of all, shame on you. Shame on me. So, but if if, if that's the case, is there a pen, aside from you all having an outside firm come in and demolish my property and so forth, then charge me for it through a lien on the property? Is that is there a fine in addition? In other words. If you're if you're if you're you know out of state or whatever and you're not really worried about things, and you get a bill for the demolition, what's the difference between that bill and and having calling a demolition company myself and having, you know, somebody tear it down? In other words, is there an additional penalty to that negligent person or, or entity if they if they if they if the town has to go through that exercise? Unfortunately, no. The only way that we can issue a fine is through the magistrate. The town does not have the authority to go out and find people additionally. We can make a case, we can make a case through code, and, and that's where I, I mentioned before, the two are kind of intertwined yeah. both on the FEMA side and as far as code goes. But you can um, see how somebody could yes, methodically kind of think, well, I'll just if the town's going to do it and they're going to bill me, I'll just, I'll just deal with that. It's, it's easier than me going out and trying to find a it, contractor. It, it's probably going to be a lot more against the property owner when we do it than if they would have went out and did it. Like that's what I'm trying. That's what yes, I'm sir. trying to get out. Yes, yes sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, uh, what, what Andy was uh, referencing there uh, was uh, through the CDBGR uh, that we're actively involved with with Lee County. Uh, we've been awarded um, uh, our first bucket, which is uh, recommended for uh, be dispersed to us, and that's on our planning side. Um, the buckets are concurrent, so that you, you need to be involved with one group to advance to the other group. Uh, currently, we uh, have the, the next group coming up in front of us is the low-income housing uh, bucket. Uh, this one here is for the long-term recovery plan. Um, it, it'll help uh, we, tentatively getting awarded uh, $1.5 million 
uh, towards using on planning. Uh, R2P2 project comes to mind, uh, also a FEMA-funded project, um, and that gives us our downtown recovery, our island-wide recovery, uh, looking at all assets of green space, uh, things like that as we move forward. So this was a, a, a big win for us um, in that first step. So this, the ask we had for these funds was how much? One point five million. Yes. And that's what's on their agenda for tomorrow for approval. Yes, sir. <laughs> just needed to clarify. And that. that's, that's all you thought. can yeah. apply for. It was yeah. just this. This is the category. Right. If you want money, you got to apply. If you don't, no. I think it's important that so people we, understand that, that there's different buckets of money right. that, that comes as out as of. We move forward. Right. We'll try to explain those as we as, as we, we get, get close to them. them. Uh, we have one coming up on infrastructure, and that's what Jason and myself and uh, Felicity Edwards and her team from Tidal Basin, who are the subject matter experts in CDBGR, are currently putting together our ask for infrastructure. Very good. What else you got? That's it, sir. Oh. 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 <coughs> oh. Come on up. Hey, uh, Chad Sheets, Town of Fort Myers Beach, uh, environmental staff. So I had asked uh, if I could. Um, we are going to be, we're, we were supposed to be opening our bids today for the big beach renourishment project. Uh, we were asked to clarify uh, in the specifications on whether or not the town would allow for trucking sand. Um, 24 hours a day for a period of approximately 75 days. Uh, this would run from the uh, northern corridor, which is around the 500 block, which is where they would be bringing sand in from the offshore burr area. And one option that they would have instead of building an entirely separate corridor straight to uh, the southern uh, segment would be to uh, truck the sand from that northern corridor to the southern segment. It's just an additional option um, for the contractors to possibly have uh, cost savings for the town. Uh, but the crux of the issue is would um, us as a town allow for 24 hour trucking? Again, it would be for approximately 75 days starting around the September mark after shorebird season is done. I think the big question I would have with that is what kind of savings would we be talking and how would it affect the taxpayers who would be most impacted by these trucks running 24 hours a day? But you're probably no way to tell that until the bid goes out. Yeah, it's it's tough to predict. I, I don't I, I would not be able to answer that. And have we reached out to any of the homeowners or businesses on the beach that I'm certain many would have a problem with? You know, the onus, you know, wherever it's next to, there's going to be noise issues the only right. silver lining is that it's during summertime storm season um a downtown <coughs> for the island if you will um you know the the contractor would be responsible for procuring that staging lot uh so it would be difficult to you know necessarily predict exactly which neighbors we need would need to talk to um but it's uh again how far are you talking about uh, so we'd be there would be trucks running um, from the so approximately you know somewhere around the 500 block of Astero, so north of the pier, all the way to uh, the Wyndham is our uh, our uh, planned staging access for the southern segment. So to the 6,000 block. So if if we didn't allow <clears throat> excuse me if we didn't allow the 24 hour. How much time would that add on to the whole beach project because they couldn't get the sand up and down as quickly? Have they said anything? Yeah, it's it's tough to communicate all these things with the cone of silence. Um, I'm not really supposed to be talking to contractors and all that kind of stuff, so um, I don't have a great answer for you. It would, I would, I would guess it would at least probably double the time, um, daylight to to nighttime. And then we're um, running into the holidays and Christmas and right well it again it you know there's still that southern corridor so if that's not an option then they just use the there's a southern corridor from say the Matanzas Ebb Shoal that's you know off towards Sanibel we have two corridors one that's going to the 500 block um, mm -hmm. to pump sand in there and then another one straight to the uh, southern segment uh, near Leonardo Arm so those options still exist. Again, this is just um, 
uh, our coastal engineers and staff trying to make as many options possible for the contractors to give us as competitive price as possible. And, you know, do we, as a community, want to say we understand it's going to be noisy for a couple of months, but, uh, you know, there's cost savings associated with that. Not that I can quantify those right now, but um, that's why we're we're asking for it. So are you looking for a decision from the council today on whether or not we would be okay with allowing trucks to run 24 hours a day? Yeah, looking for a consensus. Our, our addendum is, is due out. Um, to respond to the contractors and we would be looking to push the opening of the bids to next Monday. So we would need, um, yeah, right. well, with, with Captiva, um, op also opening on Friday, um, we were, it was suggested, um, in emails this morning that maybe we don't want to both be opening sand projects on the same day. So there may be some, some jostling there that I haven't spoken to Miss Amy about yet. Yeah. They kind of touched on that a little bit at the TDC meeting, which I know you were at as yes, well. Sir about trying to get the same contractor if possible to do all of it so they're only staging once is this part of the reason that that's part of the reason why we don't want to open it on the same day um the same the same bidders are all you know the same contractors are all bidding on all of these projects right. and there are um going to be um you know for the successful bidder that can <clears throat> get all the regionalization going they will be able to save uh mob and demob costs for all the projects together right. and the county as a whole how many bidders do you think will end up bidding? Would they say there's only like six or, at the TDC meeting? They said there's only like six or eight con companies in the country that do this. Yeah, for the offshore, the one that's 30, 30 nautical miles, it's it's a it's a lot smaller group. Um, us by having both the uh, closer borough area as well as the offshore, uh, that does open it up to I believe the the medium sized dredgers. I don't I don't mm -hmm. necessarily know how many that is. Were you able to look up Miss Amy or? Uh, yeah, it was yeah. there. Was, it wasn't a wasn't a large number. No. Chad, can they give us a bid for eight or ten hours or twelve hours a day, and then an add-on for twenty-four hours a day? You can just go ahead and do it, and just just give us the comparison with the bid. Because you haven't done a twenty-four hour bid yet, you're going to have to ask them to do that, right? Right. Does that sound like something we could do? We could do that. Yeah, we can do that we in the addendum. Whatever you tell us to. Uh, that way, you can see the number, and you can see the option, yeah. you can see the route. You can see. I'm I'm very concerned about the route, and well, the noise I, I think and the things like thing that. Is, like uh, Councillor Woodson said, price and time frame. Mm -hmm. So, just hey, this is the price for twelve hours. This is the price and the time frame for twenty-four. So we can look at you solving problems. Cost benefit. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that work for can you? Can we, can we do that? I hope so. Yes, we can. We can do any of that. Okay. We just have to okay. just compile. What you just did. We just need to <laughs> compile it pretty quick and get that out there. All right. Yeah, I think that'll be beneficial. Then people can weigh in on it one way or another yeah. when they see what it is. Sounds good. <clears throat> Thank you. I right. need a Thanks. motion. Oh, you need a motion to do I that? I would. Okay. I already acknowledged Chad, <clears throat> Chad, just a, just one one additional clarification. And it, and, it, and, and it it seems like the contractor, if they worked with the town, there's there's areas that would be less impacted than others, in terms of that 24 hour sand, in terms of its impact on residential folks, and the Wyndham property is pretty good property. Because obviously the Wyndham's vacant and Sandrack is still working on getting it, you know, coming back. And the Red Coconut property is that a property that could be part of this process? It's it's possible. <clears throat> Excuse me, but the uh, proximity to the North Corridor is probably going to dictate the choosing of the staging area. So the North Corridor coming into the 500 block um, is going to uh make lots around there more preferable what is the 500 block it's around so cane palm is 600 uh maybe maybe cause okay. apply south of us okay yes no north north, north of the north, pier. north of the ta uh, just water be, tower just before north of the water tower pink okay pink shells, I think. So, Chad, i'm sure they're going to do this but the number of trips i mean they know how much tonnage and how many trips in a how much in a truck and all that we can know the number of trips as well uh, probably per day would probably help as well yeah yes, i think sir. it is as much information as you can get out of the bid for people to make an educated decision on whether or not they want to allow that or not 
would yeah, be better. That, that Wyndham location is good, except in a perfect world, if, if the Wyndham folks could allow folks to have a beach access on the other side of the building, which I think they do, um, I just don't think people know about it. That would take some of the pressure down in that neighborhood there, because I think they just they're just concerned. Is they're, they're obviously they like to see the Wyndham torn down. A, B, they'd like to maintain their beach access, uh, but that's possible on the other side of the building. <coughs> um, I just I just think we just need to think with the contractors just to do it in a sort of a user friendly way if it's possible. Uh, I know these are are, are challenges, but um, yeah, just just food for thought. But I, I you're you're. That, that red coconut property seems to have worked pretty well, too, without having any, because there's just nobody around there. I mean, it's... It did, yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Even, yeah. Where, they, even where they move now down across from the water tower is a, a good site because there's yeah. not a lot around that right now either. That, that was a good choice. I don't think the selection of the property is going to be as important as the 24-hour trucks Correct. running up and down the no. beach. Right. Yeah, where they will. place the sand and move it is going to yeah. be the well, least that's, of Well, that's where the trucks beep, though, is when yeah, they're the going in reversing and they're, you know, yeah. going forward and back and forth. And the tractor. There will be 24-hour construction on the beach itself with the dredge. There, there has that to is, be, right? Yes. Right. yes. That's, yes. It's just the, the, the addition of the trucking. Yeah. That's a very good point. Okay. Good. Thank you. Oh, wait, you wanted a motion, right? Okay. Yes. So I'll make a motion to instruct staff to get two options, 24-hour day trucking and normal daylight, no. daylight, daylight yeah. trucking. Less than 12 hours. And length of time and cost. Yes. Well, I think that would be part of the, hopefully would be part yeah. of their. Because we'll it do. can make the decision very easy. Mm -hmm. All right. I got a motion. There's second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Any more discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. That's all we have, Mayor. Okay. Go ahead. I, 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 th I was going to say, because it's been such a short meeting, I have a question, but I, it's getting longer and longer. But, <laughs> but so, so if you could just give a brief... 10,000 foot answer, uh, Andy, Frankie, or Joe. We haven't heard much recently from Tidal Basin and that process. Is FEMA actually starting to write the town checks for reimbursement, or are we still in the filing <laughs> process stage? So, currently, um, and I apologize for that, um, with the switch over from Ann Compson to Heather Pritchett with uh, Tidal Basin. Uh, there was a little bit of disconnect there as far as how we wanted things to go. When you we say still switch over, briefings every tell, week. tell us about the switch over. I don't even um, I don't think Ann I knew. Thompson was the original person in charge of the, the group that came from Tidal Basin in the beginning. At least she was here when I when Right. I, I don't think count. she was the original, but right, yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you know, she was coming and talking before council and uh, in, in giving you information. Uh, there was a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, we still get our biweekly briefings on what they have. There's a lot that have been put up stream so to speak um and uh let's just say the flow backwards is is a trickle so there's a, there's a lot that's been submitted correct but not a lot that's been no check not a lot of checks have been written at, correct. This, at this point thus far correct. i was just curious basically right. for administrative costs and a few other items like that um, that we've received but uh, the big projects have not been uh, allocated yet and is that just a time as, uh, it's it, a it, twofold it had to do with the budgetary process in washington okay and how fema gets refunded um, there might be a little break in that this coming week, uh, from what I understand. Uh, on a few things, it's tied to other bills and whatnot. Um, so there has been a lot of push back and forth on both sides on, on how to get that stuff done. So, uh, But, yes, we, we seem to have that. And I will have them by our next meeting, giving you a regular monthly overview it's, of what's it's, happening. As poor Joe tries to do a budget in this, in this environment, I assume that creates challenges, or are we relatively optimistic that it's, FEMA it's, will it's, come it's, through? It's more than challenges. Uh, they will come, tr uh, come through. It's just the process. Sir. Okay. All right. Well, I think the important thing that I'd like to see, and we used to get them, but we don't get them now, is one, what's been submitted of all the 200 plus million dollars or whatever it is that we've submitted, what's been obligated, because then once they obligate it, that means that they're they're going to write they're, the check. They're write the check. Yeah. So I'd like to see what's been obligated okay. and what is still pending review to really get an understanding of how much money is out there that we're waiting to get. Well, back. Mr. Mayor, you just you just said something interesting. I'd never heard that. We've submitted two hundred million dollars. I want to say that we've uh, identified in, in over like a couple yes, hundred sir. million dollars worth yes, of projects. Yeah. yeah. Really. 
And I know I don't know how much has been submitted, but it I would be nice I, to see that. It'd be great to see a general breakdown of that. That I didn't realize the number had gotten that high. Because the key word there is obligation. Once they obligate it, that means they've looked at it, they concur with the numbers, and you'll get a check for it. Wow. You still okay. have to put the money out for it. To your point, now Joe's got to put on his magic hat and yeah, all right, and make make magic work. But um, but that's that's an important list to see. That's I mean everything else gets very granular in there as to what is in the project. But I think just a brief overview of. The list of the projects, the total dollar amount, what's been obligated, what hasn't been obligated, and where it is in the process. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. That'd be great. Thank you. <clears throat> Anything else for Andy before we move on to... No? Nope. Becky, you're up. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Council member items and report. Council Safford, we'll start with you. Uh, just for public record, um, I'd like to inform... The council that uh, Joe, finance director, uh, and myself, and Wade Sansbury, who is one of the auditors from Marlon Jenkins, had a conference call last week um, with regards to a forensic accountant. And from a financial aspect, he felt at this time there was no need to engage one at this time. And we've also had heard from council as well that just the cost benefit right now just would not make sense. Okay, very good. Anything else? Nope. Council Woodson? Yeah, I have two things. Um, so one is more of a question. It's kind of been brought to my attention that with the mooring balls, um, that there is a limit on the time frame that people can be on the mooring balls, and it's not for residents. So I guess where I'm going with this is, like, you can have people living on their boat like in a marina mm -hmm. um but what about people who want to live on a boat on a mooring ball that possibly work on the island that would be a lot cheaper option for them than trying to find housing either on the island or off the island if they could live on a boat have we ever talked about that or brought that up or that, that actually came up in the last Anchorage Advisory Committee uh, a workforce housing option through the mooring uh, facilities I, I think that the, the struggle is if, if that is a good idea the struggle is the, the 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 longer the boats traditionally that have been at the mooring field the more those boats tend to become problematic and uh, abandoned and challenging um, but that's that's before we've actually had a formal program to encourage workforce housing through mm -hmm. the boats. So uh, we actually had a, a pretty significant discussion about that. I don't know if Jed wants to comment on it, but I, I think uh, it's an interesting concept. Uh, I think there's there's reticence because again, uh, the boats, many of the boats that had been there for a long time, were del were sometimes I don't want to overgeneralize, but were dilapidated and problematic, and. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there's also a limited number of mooring balls, and the, 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 it's a very popular facility. And the more we turn those around, the more economic activity we generate for the community. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a great policy uh, conversation for the council because it does have an impact on the, on, on the facility and, uh, and what we're trying to accomplish broader with the, from a tourism and from a pump out boat and from a, but, but there's also the workforce housing piece as well. So it's a, I think it's a it's a big policy discussion that 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 would be good for the council at some point. Um, could I say something? Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at the agreement we have with the state. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, to okay. see what it allows, it may not allow that, but I can look into it. I mean, I mean, it'd be an option even if you limited the number of, you know, annual living or something like that. You know, and just had like 80% open to turnover and 20% that could maybe be affordable housing space. Yeah, the um, the harbor management plan, I believe, allows up to 10% um, to be greater than six months at the discretion of the town. So. Check it out. Okay. Oh, my other thing. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> no, no, just one more. This is more just FYI and making sure that we're all still on the same page. Um, so the Lee County Commissioner's meeting is tomorrow morning at 930. 
um, and they are awarding the contract to Stantec for our peer. And I wanted to speak at public comment and just reiterate um, our position on it, knowing that we are, you know, still looking for a bigger, better peer, if possible, that the council endorse that and that we would like to be included as progression goes on and design and, and have input on that. And I just wanted to make sure that we are all still on the same page before I voice that for our council. I don't know. Has anybody changed their mind as far as I mean, it certainly doesn't hurt to, to make a point. Yeah, I'm comfortable for it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I had, I had talked to Commissioner Sandelli at a meeting that we had on Friday, totally different um, topic, but I had made mention that I wanted to do that. He encouraged it. So I just wanted to let everybody know that I will, if everyone's in agreement, I will make that stance. Please, okay. thank you. Okay. Anything else? That's it. All right. Vice Mayor Adderholt. Just uh, two questions for the next M&P meeting. Um, is it possible, and maybe it's already planned, Amy, I don't know, uh, we were going to have a discussion uh, on kind of how things are going in permitting and, and almost sort of like a, a, a input from staff on best, suggested best practices for so how businesses and residents can get their stuff through as quickly as possible. Just kind of a, a, an interchange, uh, or a, a kind of a little dialogue, if you will. Most common errors they're seeing, most common challenges that people that could be avoided, best practices. What are they seeing? What kind of what's their most common questions they're getting? I just have a maybe a maybe a discussion like that. Uh, and then we were also talking about maybe having a discussion from the vendor for the lighting for Estero Boulevard. Just come in and just kind of talk about their plan of attack and and what they're what their what their what their schedule is going to be and how it'll all play out, it's, you know, in a, in a in a high level. Uh, to that to that point, we had just got an email over the weekend that they are going to start uh, with a office, a mobile office at our South Tower facility, <coughs> and also start uh, ramping up uh, logistics as far as bringing in procured items and to store them at our South Water facility, which is under lock and key. Yeah, I'd be great uh, at some point as, as they get started to put up a poll just so people can see what the. I don't think, I don't think the public's fully prepared for what's coming. Uh, I think it's great what's coming, but but I think with the more they could, we could just kind of, just give a an, a an overview as to what they're, how it's all going to play out and in what order and what it'll look like and, just a kind of a. I just we haven't heard from the vendor yet, and I think that might be nice. I think did. Jump in there on the, at, uh, if you want to see what it's going to look like, go to Crescent. Yep, no, those, I've looked. Th yeah, those <laughs> polls. Yeah, I've yeah, looked. Th yeah. Those polls. It'll be the same poll, same light, it, with the exception of instead of eight bulbs, there'll be six. But I think for the public to see how many polls will be involved and how it won't impact these will be in addition to the power polls. Mm -hmm. I think just there's and the side streets and how that'll work. I just think it'd be very interesting for people just to True. get an overview of what's. It's a big deal. Have we received an updated, I know they sent us the original plan of where the poles would be on both sides of the road and down the side streets. We haven't received an updated plan of that, have we? No, sir. Okay. I can reach out to Christopher Powell and get that for you. If it's, I mean, if it's something that we could get out for the public that really wants, I mean, this has been a seven-year project, so there are some people that would like to see where the poles are going to be located. Um, I did notice a couple spots where it's going to be a huge conflict that they're going to have to adjust, which in any project you ever do when it comes to the construction things change but it'd be nice to be able to get that out for people to kind of help answer some of the questions of the well, we can get that and put that on our web page if Perfect. it's available I'll, but, it, but, but if the vendor could out. come to an M&P and just yeah. just to answer questions maybe just give a little bit of an overview and just kind of walk people through what they're going to do we can do that yeah, assuming they're a good presenter I don't I've not met these folks but if they're <laughs> some are some are good presenters some are not so if is that's it, not a that good a, fit was that a shot at the uh, 2017 MPO <laughs> presentation. Well, I never thought about that. Yeah. That's what I thought. It was. Certainly, our maybe our lighting consultant, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I've got. Thank you, Councilor King. I have nothing, Mr. Mayor, but I would like to reserve the balance of my time uh, for right before adjournment. Okay, I didn't know you had a set time, but now you do. I have just a couple of things. Um, the first thing that is there is a. Um, 
been some discussion out there, and if there's a, someone that would like to revisit it um, to add it to an MMP is the bike ordinance. We've been getting a lot of people talking about uh, the bike ordinance, and the, the it's amazing how things come up when enforcement gets ramped up. Mm -hmm. So um, I would certainly like to take a look at it. And, you know, we are trying to promote <clears throat> walkability, bikeability, and, and uh, there are some things in that ordinance, I think, that are counterproductive to that vision or that goal. So if there's someone else that would like to see that added to an MMP for discussion. I would love to see that added. Mr. Okay. Mayor, can we, can we add that and then also add in conjunction with that something that came up when the chair of the Public Safety Committee was here about that alternative that new route. bike path, mm -hmm. potentially, mm -hmm. you know, but that would involve the red coconut property and behind. We have a meeting tomorrow, so I'll yeah. make sure to bring it up there. But to... I would love to have that be part of that conversation because they're, I know they're different, but they're related. And and I was going to plan on asking them tomorrow to talk to both the fire. We we had got something in the past that had given us numbers when they were originally looking at Estero Boulevard as far as pedestrian and bikes and accidents and things like that. But that only went up to 2017. It would be nice to get the numbers over the last five or six years to see how those correlate to what those were before and, and be able to make a decision one way or another. I think those numbers are important to discuss at that point. But if we, could, if, we could, if we could figure out an alternative bike path, oh, yes. yeah. it would be tremendous. I just noticed Jason's shoelaces. Wow, those are on fire. <laughs> He's got those on every week. Um, the other thing, I got three other things, but they hopefully it was brought to my attention this Sunday that there's evidently some FDEM letters going out about the Ian Debris cleanup thing. People are starting to receive letters um, in conjunction, and I don't have all the details yet, but if it's something that we can reach out to FDEM about, they're sending out letters now. People that participated in the Ian Debris cleanup are are now getting things about insurance and one lady said that she got a saying that she owes thirty two thousand dollars for a slab and so i don't have all the details but it sounds like there's and i did get an email from someone later in the day that day saying they got something as well asking them to sign and it has to do with insurance and insurance payouts so if we could get some clarification from fdm to be able to put out on our website for people to to understand what exactly that is because there's some people are afraid to sign things that they don't understand and I'd hate to see them be charged for something that they, they just simply don't understand. So I know we, uh, Representative Botano yesterday yeah. talked about referring them to his office. Yeah, and he, yeah, that's a good resource too, as well, to reach out to him and um, to, just so that we have a better understanding. So when we get asked about, it, I had not heard about it until Sunday when it was brought to my attention. So um, <clears throat> the other thing is the we had the TDC meeting on Thursday of last week, and I brought up. The Times Square um, issue and had mentioned that our legal team had reached out and uh, the attorney that's there will just say was very short um, it was I spoke I spoke to your attorney and it was evidently it was she said it was over ownership and to me that's confusing because we know who owns that we know who owns that so what I'm trying to get at is what they're Someone from Cape Coral made a presentation to try to get some funding, but it was through the the, the um, shoreline, beach and shoreline bucket. Well, evidently there's more buckets that things could fall into. So I'm, I'm just trying to get clarification as to why I keep being told it's a state statute, which is in your realm. So if there's some state statute that I'm aware of or someone can provide me as to why Times Square can't be considered a beach access, even though it's the most visited beach access in all of Lee County, and why we can't. I just want to understand why we are not able to receive funding out of any bucket through the TDC. If there's $60 million sitting there in reserves, and some of that could go to help for public safety, for anything else that needs to be done, the for the pier, whatever, something that makes that beach access now accessible to receive funds, um, the temporary trailers that are sitting there for the bathrooms, things like that, the services that people expect to have when they go to that part of the beach, um, I just, I just... If you can help me out with that, because it sounds like the, the communication between Nancy and their attorney didn't really go anywhere. Um, I just want to make sure when I go to the next meeting, I'll bring it up again, because I'm not getting any response as to why. So far, ever since I've been involved in politics on the island, it's always been beating our throat that it doesn't qualify. Well, why doesn't it qualify? And is there something we can do policy-wise to make it qualify? That's what I'm trying to get to the answer of. And then I'll leave people alone about it. Uh, and then the last thing is the traffic plan that was was presented here at the 
I mean, just to be blunt, this is never going to happen. And I'll tell you why. There's a lot of entities that are in your plan here. You've got FDOT that owns the bridge. Then you've got the base of the bridge in Estero Boulevard, which is owned by Lee County. So we can't, even if we wanted to make the changes that you have on this, we can't do it. That's something that has to be done at their level. And I could tell you we've been involved with this roundabout for many, many, many years. And we have, through the Public Safety Committee and through the Council, have voiced our concern with the traffic pattern that was presented to us to basically be told this is the way it's going to go. So is it possible? I, I could tell you that the bridge, they looked at the bridge and there was a big thing about expanding the bridge and cantilevering the bridge and having some of the things that you have in your plan here and it just structurally cannot do that. So to be able to do the bridge part of it, um, some of the other things where the roundabout is involved, again, that's Lee County. We, we can't change the traffic patterns there. Um, as far as the light, I, my guess is, you know, you got a sidewalk going through the middle of Margaritaville. I don't know that they're going to want a sidewalk through the middle of their property, but maybe they do. Um, That's the existing sidewalk. Along. It said need sidewalk. It says oh. need sidewalk. But anyway, no, I get it. Well, that's county owned again. The, the county owns that. We don't own that. Um, and then some of the EV and the bike lanes that you've proposed, great ideas going down past Crescent. The issue is right away. There's not enough right away. That's why there's not a bike lane, specific bike lane in that area until you get down to the red coconut part of it. So I would I would suggest if you want to make some of these changes, I'd reach out to FDOT or reach out to the county commission and, and present this to them because they're the ones that make the decision on what the the most decision on what you're trying to propose here. Does that make sense? Right now, again, that's controlled by FDOT, and it's for, and it's only for bikes and and uh, buses. So that's a good. No, I I understand. I I, I know. I, I yeah. I don't want to go back and forth, and you have to be up with the mic anyway. I just wanted to let you know, your I appreciate your intent and the time that you put into this, but I want to make sure that you're you're driving that at the people that actually can make that decision one way or another. And those would be the two entities I would start with, because nothing else on here works without what you're you've kind of got going on there and i i wish you luck and i hope you have better luck than the entire town of fort myers beach has had because we have not been able to move the needle oh. okay no nope, understand well, there's no idea is a bad idea that's right you know it's, i'd that, like to piggyback on that a little bit if you could um ahead. the public service uh public safety committee when we met with them jointly um wanted a presentation about what was happening at the base of the bridge i coordinated that with the project manager uh, that'll be happening at your meeting in May, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. But at that time, he wanted me to let everyone on that committee know that the uh, FDOT has moved from taking input to implementing now. Yes. Now, obviously, that's been delayed now because it was supposed to have started this month. But I just wanted, um, I don't know if they'll be willing to listen or not. So I just wanted to share that. No, I appreciate it. It's a, And I think they've kind of started some of it. I noticed they were marking on the other side of the bridge. They were doing some utility markings and... And that was going to always be before the base of the bridge roundabout stuff anyway, as far as their progress. All right, you said you need some time here before we get to the... Uh... If you indulge me, today's tax day. <laughs> so that brings out the old disc jockey in me. Way to bring down the meeting. F-Rock, Stereo 98 on your dial. Um, I instantly recall an um, artist I used to play country music with called Johnny Paycheck. And that brings to mind a song, and it's not Take This Job and Shove It, so that's for my detractors, but uh, he had another one that was more appropriate called Me and the IRS. He ironically named Mr. Paycheck, saying, from uh, now on, I'm keeping my pay, ain't going to deduct none, so put your 1040 form where the sun don't shine. Wow. However, I think as patriots, we should subscribe to the Robert Cray's 1040 Blues that says, you know, I'm thinking about moving somewhere else, but I can't because I love America too much. And with that, I'll move to adjourn. Sounds like a flashback second. Friday. You got a motion by Councilor King and a second by Councilor <laughs> Safford. Any discussion? If not, we. all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, we are adjourned at 1148. Jim, you might have some competition.